Hello and welcome to a special episode of Heterodox History. Today we are going to be discussing the 2017 film by, forgive my pronunciation if it is absolutely terrible, Armando Iannucci. Nevertheless, he's Glaswegian Columbus, so it's more in common with you than most Italians. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing this evening, Columbus? I'm doing well, yes. Um, it's been a nice relaxing day. I'm looking forward to my weekend and I I got to watch a very, a very entertaining film. So yeah, glad, glad to be here. Yes, it is. I, this is one of probably my favorite films in the last 10 years. It hits that very sort of strange spot for me where it appeals to me aesthetically in terms of the school, in terms of the costumes. It appeals to me as a lover of history and it appeals to me as someone who very much appreciates a good dark comedy or almost yeah. an inappropriate comedy, <laughs> uh, pushing the boundaries of comedy in that sense. So on many, many levels, I appreciate this film. And I would recommend to anyone listening to this now that, to go away and watch the film first before we talk about it, because I really don't want to spoil the film for you if you haven't seen it. Nevertheless, if you're not going to do that and you're just going to listen to me and maybe be convinced later to watch the film, <laughs> uh, you can always do that. Um, I really am. Um, I really am curious. You know how well known this film is outside of outside of Britain. Um, you know, was it a sort of big thing in America? Because I know, I know, in Russia they really didn't take to it, <laughs> to say the least. But yeah, we'll, 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 get, to we'll get to that. We'll get to that towards the end. But in terms of raw box office figures, despite its you know all star cast. Uh, the film only made something like a you know tw a double return on its budget, and when you look at box office receipts, you have to understand that the budget you know needs to be doubled to also incorporate advertising. Yeah, so really, yeah. it made very little money, despite the yeah. Fact I mean, that usually, so usually films end up like a successful film is like what's like a five times margin or something yeah. like that. Usually, yeah. And I can only attribute that to the fact that this film is perhaps filling a very particular niche. Uh, one that'll be, you know, appeal to people like me, but uh, not mass audiences, certainly. Um, I can understand, uh, but then again, I can't, cause to me, comedy is very subjective, and I don't really want to go into that discussion hmm. and really focus on the um, the actual history. Uh, so overall thoughts on the film before we move on to the... Uh... Um, I Well, I think I think you certainly see the sort of, the identifying marks, don't you, of uh, Iannucci, because... Um... You know, if anyone's ever watched his other work, like the thick of it, and I think he did Veep as well, didn't he? With um, with, with Elaine from Seinfeld, is it not? Um, well, he yeah, also get... did um, Alan Partridge of all yeah, things as well. Partridge. Yes, wow. as well. Yeah, and you get that sort of um, that peculiar sort of strain, this almost absurdist strain running through all of his work. You know, when they're all of the characters will just start um, um, bickering very comically one minute, um, and then it will shift and they'll be talking about something very serious or something quite morbid um so in a way i think it's a sort of um quite a perfect job for ianucci and i think it was quite an inspired choice um to to make a film about this subject and i just i i wonder exactly how he came to it well of course um the inspiration were was um a series of french comics right but um i wonder how he got his hands on those Yes, in terms of the the background, there's a there's a bit of history regarding some of the influences. So, um, the I, I believe it's the the first ring by um, Solzhenitsyn is one of the influences behind you know, some of the jockeying and the conspiracies mm. going around in Stalin towards the end. Um, there was a radio play based off a famous book called Testimony, which we're going to talk about a lot by uh, Solomon Volkov. It's quite, um, it's often a treat. Well, so Volkov uh, claimed that the book was the uh, relayed memoir of Dmitry Shostakovich, the famous Soviet era composer. Nevertheless, that uh, provenance has always been called into uh, question regarding, you know, um, a, a lot of aspects of the book, which we'll get into. But then, needless mm -hmm. to say, that the, the book is of questionable provenance. Uh, the book was later adapted into a radio play for the BBC in the 1980s, the Stalin Sonata. Um, I also believe that there was some form of film involving uh, Ben Kinsey at some point. I haven't seen it, uh, mm -hmm. which was uh, based on this as well. Um, so there are sort of lingering cultural elements based on particular aspects of this story, which have been around. And they were synthesized into this series of French comics graphic novel uh, from, 19, from 2010 to 2012 called you know, Death of Stalin. 
And many aspects of the first half of that graphic novel play out almost exactly, um, even down to uh, Yodina accepting a bribe rather than being given a gift by Stalin, but we'll get yeah. into later. So that's... By, by the know, way, I'm, I'm curious about the Solzhenitsyn book. Is, is Ring one way it's translated? Because I always heard it as Circle. It was first circle. Yes, the first circle, as in reference to Dante. So yes, that's that's probably me. Oh wow, it. that I actually that didn't cross my mind. That's interesting. So yeah, so that that's sort of the basic background to to this film and the production value. Well, the, you know, the production of the film. Um, as to why Inuchu decided that this would be, you know, a fantastic basis for a dark comedy film, I can't really say. But nevertheless, <laughs> the uh, the prototype for it was already out there, and it simply needed to be adapted for um for the big screen. But I understand that people coming to this or even watching the film may have not really know anything about uh, Soviet history or the history of Joseph Stalin. So to sum this up as briefly as I can, um, in, the 19, in 1917, you have the Russian Revolution. The October Revolution really happened in November, where the Communist um, Party, the Bolshevik Party, led by Vladimir Lenin, uh, gets rid of the provisional government, which had formed in the aftermath of the collapse of the Tsarist regime in Russia. Over the next five years, they spend time consolidating the first world's first uh, communist government. And uh, Stalin begins to accrue power as one of Vladimir Lenin's lackeys as general secretary of the Communist Party, which was a rather innocuous yeah. position, which he was able to use to monopolize the bureaucratic superstructure of the Yeah, Soviet I was going to say, you know, he's, he's sort of he's dealing with a lot of um, a lot of papers and a lot of information is passing through his hands. So yeah, it was certainly a position that an enterprising man like like Joseph could make use of. Uh, control over appointments in particular. And also yeah, he was yeah. able to play off a lot of the uh, old uh, communist vanguard against the ambitions of everyone basically perceived uh, Leon Trotsky as the would-be successor. Yeah. And there was this pervading historical phobia among the communist ranks about Bonapartism, a military figure from the revolutionary cabal taking power and establishing a one-man dictatorship. Mm. And given the fact that uh, Trotsky has made his, had made his name being the commissar for war in the quite, quite a brave quite a brave um figure in the war was he not yes well he was essentially responsible for the victory um yeah. everyone assumed that trotsky would succeed after lenin and perhaps evolve into this bonaparte-esque figure so when lenin began to fail and suffered from a series of strokes from 1922 onwards stalin formed part of a troika or a triumvirate with uh, lev kamenev and zinoviev in order to keep uh, Trotsky from power and he also pursued this idea of again to summarize very briefly socialism in one country we're going to abandon the idea that communism needs to spout out everywhere all at once and it's going to be a worldwide workers revolution rather we're going to build socialism in one country and then use that as a power base in order to expand the revolution to many you know vanguard revolutionaries they believe this idea was tantamount to heresy well, yeah i mean it's international communism right? yes yeah. it, especially if you believe that socialism marxism is a scientific concept and this was accepted by many of the more moderate members of the uh the bolshevik party simply because the soviet union which was formed in uh, the early 1920s had been a state of constant war and of course the russian empire before it in world war one so this was simply a breathing space to allow the new regime to consolidate rather yeah. than expend all resources and manpower to bring about the revolution now so stalin was able again presenting himself more as a moderate figure to slowly ostracize trotsky and by the end of the 1910 uh, 1920s trotsky had been expelled from the party and from the country and thereafter now that trotsky was removed stalin began pinching a lot of his policies including collectivization of farmland, where farmland was essentially placed under the control of workers' collectives, but really under the control of the state, eliminating much uh, of the private peasant economy which had existed before, and anyone who opposed this was accused of being a kulak, um, mm. essentially a individual farmer or wealth, wealth, wealthy sort of petty bourgeois, uh, petty bourgeoisie counter-revolutionary counter, um, element, whatever <laughs> you can, you can yeah. call it. And uh, this, of course, led to a series of famines in the 1920s, most notably the Holdemort in Ukraine and the Donbass yeah. region. 
And this is a time also where we see Stalin beginning his five-year plans to rapidly industrialize the Soviet economy from a basically agrarian base, albeit there had been a significant industrial sector left there, uh, in particular by Tsar Alexander III, and turn the Soviet Union into one of the world's sort of greatest yeah. economies in terms of the production of heavy industry, weapons yeah. of war. I mean, this tanks. is this is one of his sort of... Um you know, one of the main things that anyone who ever defends his reputation will say, oh, well, without Stalin, Hitler would have won the war because of his industrial efforts and his five-year plans and what have you. I mean, he was he was um, successful in that regard, I suppose, but um, it never ceases to amaze me how supportive so many people are of this man. It's Well, another, well, well, again, they're also, they oppose him, but not necessarily opposition based on human calamities, but based on doctrinal deviations. <laughs> it's even worse, yeah. <laughs> So continuing in this vein, we're talking about the massive wholesale um, uprooting of Russian society, not just Russian society, but all of the members, uh, the yeah. constituent Soviet Socialist Republics of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And thereafter, we have the major sort of political apotheosis of Stalin from part of a collective leadership structure within the Soviet Union. Essentially, you have various organs. All power is based in the party. Nominally, all power comes from the Supreme Soviet but in reality, power had been moving away from the trade unions and the Soviets towards centralized control very much early in the institution of the Soviet Union, almost immediately under Lenin, under the side so of... Soviet, Soviet means like a sort of meeting or... Conference Soviet or means conference workers' council. Yeah, a council, yeah. Yes, so the, the the whole idea of a Soviet Union very quickly became a oxymoron because the Soviets were quickly disempowered and authority was vested in the not just the party collectively, but the central party apparatus, um, Sovnikom, the conglomeration of all of the people's commissariats, essentially the ministries and the cabinet of the Soviet Union. And then, of course, the Politburo, which made up the most senior officials of yeah. the Communist Party. And nominally, this body was accountable to the Central Committee, which was accountable to the Supreme Soviet and all decisions were made as you know as as part of series of congresses collective decisions made by the party as a whole when in reality these congresses barely ever met especially towards the late reign of stalin yeah. yes. and decisions were made by these top officials under the proviso of course that you have democracy quote unquote within these uh, meetings you can have high ranking officials airing their discontent around a particular policy but once a policy has been settled that is now law that is now truth and all other underlings have to agree with said policy uh, at the cost of increasingly yeah. sort of greater penalties as the paranoia in the soviet union increased throughout the 1930s yes <laughs> I have, I have nothing to add to this. Um, but... And this is the setup for the Great Purge. And I want to reference this because what the film Death of Stalin really leans into is the possibility that the Soviet Union was about to undergo another Great Purge. And it, of course, is taking part in the Doctor's plot. And there is, of course, a similar plot, but on a much grander scale, the first Great Purge, which kicks off after the murder of the Leningrad, St. Petersburg, it was changed its name to Leningrad after the revolution. Uh, party leader Kirov was assassinated in 1934. Uh, there are some people even today that claim that Kirov was assassinated by a random gunman, and this had nothing to do with Stalin. But I'll put my neck out there and say that Kirov was assassinated by a operative working for Yagoda, the head of NKVD, under explicit orders by Stalin. Um, because during the previous party conference, Kirov was the most popular communist official next to Stalin. And so Stalin was eliminating a potential successor who could mm. have eliminated him in the early 1930s. And with Kirov dead, all of a sudden you have other possible links to treason against the Soviet Union, uh, various enemies, the people who are being discovered, and the paranoia ratchets up also have this idea not only of capitalist insurgents within the Soviet Union, but you have this idea of a Trotskyist plot, Trotsky is abroad, fermenting uh, factionalism, fermenting unrest in the Soviet Union, which will destroy the Soviet Union and allow the capitalists to feed on its cause. What, like year, was, um, what year was Trotsky ice-picked? 1940. Or 1941. Sorry, just for oh. yes, it, it's a lot, a little bit after this period. Um, so we're talking, you know, six years before. 
so, the so, so yeah, the, the the fear on Stalin's part is still is still there, the anxiety or yes, whatever. but the the height of the purges really take place between 1936 and 1937, in which anywhere between half a million and a million Communist Party officials are executed. Virtually all of the you know old party comrades, which had been yeah. part of all uh, the officers in the army. Yeah. The officers in the army. Well, again, when we're talking about you know political uh, opponents eliminating the purge, we're talking about people like Lev Kamenev and Zinoviev, people who had supported Stalin in the beginning, who were again accused of being part of the Trotskyist left. Then you have the so-called right within the party, Bukhalin, who was also eliminated. He was a supporter of more sort of uh, free market reforms, the new mm. economic policy, which was briefly introduced by Lenin before um, Stalin again returned to the this Trotskyist element of war communism. Um, so he's eliminating factions on both the left and the right in order to present himself as the ultimate centrist uh, <laughs> within the, within the uh, Soviet political system. But moreover, as the purges become you know, very extreme, and you mentioned the purging the army, the most infamous purging was that of Dukachevsky, who was accused of being a German spy. And if anything, German intelligence took this as a great win because Tukhachevsky was the closest thing the right of the Soviet Union at the time had to a Heinz Guderian who could have <laughs> modernized and created yeah. a effective uh, panzer corps within the Red Army. Of course, Tukhachevsky was eliminated, cutting off the head of uh, the, the Soviet Red Army. And as a result, the Red Army performed very poorly with a couple of exceptions up until about 1942. So all of these aspects were very detrimental overall to the Soviet Union, but they were very positive to Stalin. And in order to personally escape responsibility for inaugurating the purges, Stalin did something very clever. First of all, the NKDV chief, NKVD chief, who was responsible for the death of, Yugo, of uh, Kirov Yagoda, uh, was killed and replaced by Yezhov. And then Yezhov was blamed for excessive overreach in the uh, the extent of the purges and exploiting the purges for own personal gain. Oh, so Yezhov, it looks like he sort of did it to get the position. Yes. God, and Stalin so, was such a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Yezhov was eliminated and he was replaced by Leverenti Beria, the principal antagonist of this film, as head of the NKVD in 1938. Then, of course, you have the war in Finland and the war goes disastrously. And among many other things, it convinces Hitler that the Soviet army has been decapitated, is useless. And to uh, take a quote from him, all we do is all we need to do is kick in the door and the whole rotten cr uh, structure will collapse in. Yeah. Uh, the Germans invade the Soviet Union on the 21st of June or the 22nd of June. Sorry, I need to have these notes in front of me. Uh, 1941. Uh, Stalin goes into hibernation for about a week, believing he's yes, about there's to be these overthrown. Sort of, there's these stories that he's sort of in a state of what shock and all of this, right? Yes, and uh, he comes out of this when Molotov uh, comes sort of uh, desperately to him, claiming, you know, he needs to take up the mantle of leadership when Stalin and all likelihood possibly. But believed he was going to be deposed. Um, he comes out and he declares the beginning of a great patriotic war. Uh, as the war commences, Stalin is forced to rescind, uh, to give up quite a lot of uh, political power to his generals, because whenever he got involved in military affairs, it tended to go very badly, um, mm. resulting in the massive loss of um, men in every front and often squandering possible Soviet chances to push the Germans out much earlier, I think. When what would be... Um... Do, do you have a sort of, because again, it, it's not my sort of expertise, do you have an example of one of these sort of disastrous, you know, decisions that, that Stalin made? Because I know there were there were certainly some on our side as well. But Well, he was responsible for Directive 227, not one step back, which involved basically human mm. meat shields running across yeah. the battlefield. And if they were to retreat, they were to be gunned down by their own side. Uh, so things like that, which ostensibly were there to, you know, create a hard discipline, but in reality... Crushes morale, desertion. crushes morale, and expend, you know, cause a desertion, expend manpower. Um, and also, he was losing. I mean, from 1941, it really looked as if the Soviet Union could possibly collapse. By October, the Germans had reached near Moscow. And it's not, it's, it's then, right in the winter of 1941, that Stalin actually for once believes his own intelligence chiefs because Soviet intelligence was rather remarkable. They had accurately predicted the date of the German invasion, mm. but Stalin refused to believe it because he believed that his spies had been compromised by Winston Churchill, who was trying to find any pretext to bring the Soviet Union on the war on the side of the Allies. 
Um, and so he again disbelieved his own intelligence officials warning him of the invasion because mm. uh, under his own logic uh, he was a ardent student of history and he was reading the history of world war one and he was reading the history of the napoleonic wars the first great patriotic war in 1812 and he believed that hitler could never attack the soviet union without provocation so he would give no provocation under any circumstances yeah. and this included the day when the soviet union was actually invaded so the soviet leadership couldn't believe that Hitler would invade without any provocation with essentially having a de facto alliance with Nazi Germany and having an incredibly beneficial economic relationship when well, Molotov of course, I mean they just they just carved up Poland you know Molotov Ribbentrop all exactly that, the yeah. Nazi Soviet pact had uh, divided up Eastern Europe between Soviet and German spheres of influence Germany had taken over Western Poland and the Soviet Union had taken over the Baltic states they had taken over Eastern Poland which was incorporated into Belarus and Ukraine and it's, it's funny isn't it because I mean um you know it's something I, I I've read about um what 200 pages of a uh, Stalin's war you know by um yeah is it McMeekin yeah. and, he, yes. and he points out that essentially you know, it's 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 quite savvy, I suppose, from Stalin. But um, when this was happening, it's really the Germans who are doing most of the heavy lifting. Well, um, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant strategy by yeah. Stalin. But he underestimated he underestimated Hitler. Um, and you know, in fairness, he believed probably you know it, it was a sound logic from him that Hitler had no incentive whatsoever, whilst the Soviet Union was being an amicable partner to him. Yeah. And, start, and whilst he's at war with Britain and yes, France. Yes, to start right? to start a two-front war. He believed there was no logic in it whatsoever. But of course, for Hitler's logic, um, Winston Churchill, he believed, was continuing the war on the basis that the Soviet Union would eventually go to war yeah. with Germany. And so Germany was thus believing it was taking a preemptive strike to wipe out the Soviet Union, present the British with a fait accompli, and say, there is no chance you can ever win a land war, so give up rather than launching an amphibious invasion that would have destroyed the British Empire, that would have squandered uh, uh, Hitler's own ambitions. But nevertheless, that's a tangential conversation <laughs> yeah, to yeah, get into. Yeah. So, but... Hitler, Hitler's views on the British Empire. <laughs> Controversial issue. Yeah, so uh, going back to Stalin, he very quickly uh, resumes power. But as I mentioned, he has to surrender his actual military control to the various officials such as Ivan Konov and Georgi Zhukov who he mm. takes away from the Manchurian front against the Japanese finally believing that the Japanese were not going to invade the Soviet Union alongside the Germans and therefore is able to deploy elite troops from the east in order to combat the wary German offensive towards Moscow and is able to inflict the first serious defeat on the Germans in 1941. Uh, Stalin therefore uses that as an impetus to begin a series of counterattacks that failed disastrously and he is forced to rescind power again to see to Zhukov, who organizes Operation Uranus, the great encirclement of the German armies at Stalingrad, yeah. which uh, cuts off the last serious attempt, you can argue, that the Germans could have had to knock the Soviet Union out of the war. And by... um, for, for, for the Japanese, um, you know, because they never made any sort of offensives into Russia, is this because they were just too busy fighting, I don't know, the Brits and the, the Chinese or... I don't want to get this, make this too much of a tangential discussion, but the Japanese were not a unified political bloc. There were two army plans. One was advocated by the army, one was advocated by the navy. The navy plan, which won out, believed that Japan had to acquire a resource zone to fuel its war with China. The co-prosperity sphere. The, the, a, the Asian co-prosperity sphere, exactly, which would inc involve the incorporation of the Philippines, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia, what have you, which had all the resources that Japanese needed. And therefore, and they also believe that unlike the Germans, they had the opposite experience. The Germans were basing their invasion of the failed Russian invasion of Finland in 1939, 1940. The Japanese were basing their estimation over the failure of the Japanese to probe successfully into the Soviet Union. Yeah, in the, the hard war, fighting we've dealt with. Uh, yeah. With the Kark and Gold campaign and Georgi Zhukov. So they'd had the opposite experience. They believed the Soviet army was more powerful than the Germans believed, and they were not going to get involved and place uh, the Kwangtung army, which was in Manchuria at risk. But anyway, moving on uh, <laughs> back to Stalin. So after the defeat of the German forces at Stalingrad from 1943 until 1944, Stalin um, is and the Soviet army under the control of Konev, Zhukov and Rokossovsky are able to successfully push the Germans out progressively out of all the land they had gained since 1941. 
and by 1944 to 1945 they were taking over vast sections of Eastern Europe, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, coinciding with the forces of Tito, they liberate Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, uh, parts of Austria as well. And they briefly um, organize a second peace treaty with Finland, but also been fighting. So Stalin, despite the situation which he first encountered with the uh, the beginning of the war, is now the, the leader of the second most powerful nation in the world behind the United States, albeit in a considerably more impoverished state. And it's here where I want to reference back to the film, because chronologically, we arrive at the scene involving the infamous concert. Now, when I first listened to this film, because it's the opening scene, and you have Radio Moscow recording a um, uh, recording an iteration of the Adagio to the 23rd Piano Concerto by Mozart. And just in terms of details and how many details are stack up by this film and why I really want to encourage people to look at this film <laughs> when they're making historical films is I instantly knew, even without actually knowing about this particular incident because I hadn't read testimony, that this was Stalin's favorite piece of music and of course leading to the, you know, the comedic circumstance that ensues. Um, there are just a couple of things I want to start off now, which is on the score for the film, but also on that, the, the apocryphal story of that night where Stalin received his copy of that particular recording of the Adagio. Um, one is referencing to the score, Christopher Willis composed the score and there isn't that much originality in it. It's, it's rather derivative, but that was the point and Willis explains this. So he's got an article online if you want to read it. But listening to the score, there were lots of musical quotations from Shostakovich's Temp Symphony. And I didn't actually know this, before doing the research, but Shostakovich wrote his Temp Symphony after the death of Stalin in 1953. So the piece of music was contemporaneous. And again, if you read testimony, Shostakovich via Voklov claims that in particular, the second movement of the symphony was inexorable, merciless, like an evil whirlwind. It was a musical portrait of Stalin. Um, I couldn't write an apotheosis of Stalin that he wanted for his Ninth Symphony. Stalin, after the war, wanted Shostakovich to compose a grand epic uh, to involving the Soviet victory over the Germans and the Great Patriotic War, mm. but Shostakovich didn't do that. He wrote the Temp Symphony as essentially a, a musical portrait of Stalin, and that is the music which is woven throughout this. Albeit Willis has his own musical monogram and very much akin to Shostakovich. Shostakovich from around the 8th to the 10th symphony weaves a constant theme and ostinato throughout all of his works, which is D-S-C-H, D-S-C-H, and very similarly you hear a invented theme from Willis, which comes in when you have the, the introduction to Moscow and it's repeated and readapted over and over and over again, like a Shostakovich scene. So just listening to things like that and having just a rudimentary understanding of music. And I do apologize to people who had much greater understanding of music. I really wish my understanding of music was greater so I could really appreciate this. Um, I loved it, but also loved it for listening to the Mozart. And this is where I want to read an extract regarding the, the actual testimony. Uh, from Voklov on the uh, the memoir Shostakovich, because that's where we get the story of this night in 1943 or 1944. Stalin didn't let anyone in to see him for days at a time. He listened to the radio a lot. Once Stalin called the radio committee where the administration was and asked if they had a record of Mozart's piano concerto number 23, which had, he had heard on the radio the day before. Played by Udina, he added, they told Stalin that of course they had. Actually, there was no record. The concert had been live, but they were afraid to say no to Stalin. No one could ever know what the consequences might be. A human life meant nothing to him. And it's important to note that when this book came out, first of all, we don't have the original manuscript. So all the iterations and the translations are slightly different, uh, but this was used essentially as a lightning rod for a lot of the dissident elements within mm. the Soviet Union because it played Shostakovich as unrepentantly anti-Stalin. Human life meant nothing to him. All you could do was agree, submit, be a yes man, a yes man to a madman. Stalin demanded that they send the record with Udina's performance of Mozart to his dacha. The committee panicked, but they had to do something. They called in Udina and an orchestra and recorded that night. Everyone was shaken with fright except for Udina, naturally. But she was a special case. Um, and he wow. goes on to talk quite extensively about her um, 
profound piety which i think is actually a weaker point in this film because it very much comes across as rather unconvincing in mm. terms of the betrayal but anyway Udina told me later they had to send a conductor home. He was so scared he couldn't think, he couldn't write, he couldn't compose. They called another conductor who trembled and got everything mixed up, confusing the orchestra. There's also another account of that, believing that he was drunk as well in order mm. to get the motivation to do this. Only a third conductor was any shape to finish the recording. I think this is a unique event in the history of, rec of recording. I mean, changing three conductors in one night. Anyway, the record was ready by the morning. They made one single copy and sent it to Stalin. Now there was a record of the record, a record in Yesing. Soon after, Udina received an envelope with 20,000 rubles. She was told it came on the express orders of Stalin. Then she wrote him a letter. I know about this letter from her, and I know the story seems improbable. Udina had many quirks, but I can say that she never lied. I'm certain that her story is true. Udina wrote something like this in her letter. Thank you, Yosef Vizalonovich, uh, for your aid. I will pray for your day and night and ask the Lord to forgive you for your great sins before the people and the country. The Lord is merciful and he'll forgive you. I gave the money to the church that I attend. And Eugenia sent this suicidal letter to Stalin. He read it and didn't say a word. They expected at least a twitch of an eyebrow. Naturally, the order to arrest Eugenia was prepared, and the slightest grimace would have been enough to wipe away the last traces of her. But Stalin was silent and set the letter aside in silence. The anticipated movement of the eyebrows didn't come. Nothing happened to Eudina. That they, they said that the recording of Mozart was on the record player when the leader and teacher was found dead in his dacha. It was the last thing he had listened to. So referring back to what happens in the film, um, if anything, I believe this is better than the iteration we have in the film. And it's it, lovely that they use that example, but based on the original graphic novel, it seems that they took that accounting of it and used it as the basis of how they were going to interpret that because the bribe in particular, I don't understand what the creative reasoning was for including the bribe because it makes Udina seem incredibly selfish and that juxtaposes completely with her supposedly Christian consideration. Yeah. I mean, it's not only that, right? Because um, um, in the film, it's the, the, the producer in the, in the, in the hall who gives her the money, who offers her the bribe as opposed to yes. Stalin giving her the money. I also yes. find it interesting that, um, both in Shostakovich's account and I think also in the film, they talk about um, church because I was under the impression that she was Jewish and not Christian. Or did she convert to Christianity? No, she was very much Christian, Russian Orthodox. It wasn't Jewish. Really? Yeah. I must have, I must have read something wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I've never seen anything to indicate that she was Jewish. Um, but anyway, um, in terms of emphasizing uh, this... So, sorry about this. Maria Yudina, that was her name, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, born to a Jewish family in Naval. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. She converted to Orthodoxy in 1919. Okay, that's yeah. that's word. No, no, sorry about that. Um, I will be mentioning a lot of names, and unfortunately, Columba, I, I can't remember their explicit backstory. So the only no, thing that's I know, okay. that's okay. Um, was that she was definitely a Christian at she the time. Was, of she was a brave woman, whatever religion she was. Yes. <laughs> um, but no, uh, many elements. I think this is, again, I, I, I don't understand the reasoning behind this because... Uh, I mean, when when Stalin receives the message, of course, and it's the first last thing he reads before he dies that night, and it's later used by Beria as um, some sort of political um, political ploy against Khrushchev, albeit it's never really uh, utilized. Um, it goes a little bit further and calls him a tyrant. And essentially here, what we're talking about is the Christian conception of forgiveness, which doesn't really come across in the letter, which is portrayed in the film, which is far more damning uh, than the actual letter that was written to him. But I think, to my mind, almost if you started off the film like that, and then you had a time gap, then everyone was reconvened, and then you still hear that music, as Shostakovich claims, it being the last thing he ever heard. I still think that's quite powerful. And I also think it's just interesting to juxtapose the idea that Stalin wasn't, I mean, if anything, you could argue that being entirely consistent, again, killing anyone who would joke or say anything or you know, be the first one to stop clapping at a party conference. Um, this, if anything, makes it more interesting. It makes it more complicated. The fact that, again, like a true emperor, like a true autocrat is able to declare clemency 
to anyone and anything for any reason. And in this case, he wouldn't kill Udina because he loved her as a musician. Yeah. I so mean, it's even, said that, it's even said that he was moved to tears on listening to the recording, right? Exactly. So it's, again, Sovereign is he who, who makes the exception. So mm -hmm. uh, again, it's an interesting aspect of Stalin's character, which I think they, they oversimplified. Nevertheless, the idea that he was listening to this piece of music, and that was potentially the last thing that he was listening to before he died, is possible. And again, the notion of him laughing uh, when he read the note of Udina, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, he must find it, you know, cute and quaint. And of course, yeah. he had a background as a seminarian in Tbilisi uh, back in Georgia. So he would have known all about this and had a extensive knowledge of uh, basic Christian charity. And I think in order to, uh, again, I'm not trying to sort of delve too much in terms of Stalin's psychology, but I think in order to rise that far and have that background, you need to have an element of dark humor about you, not just uh, <laughs> yeah. paranoia or an evil. So it's possible that he may have laughed, but nevertheless isn't... Well, he liked, he liked, he liked a dark joke, didn't he? Oh, uh, he liked a dark joke, and, uh, and again, he liked a, a John Wayne film, and all of that was uh, accurately uh, uh, portrayed in the film. So again, it's interesting, but I, I do wonder why they chose to make Udina out to be a horrible person. <laughs> in terms of uh, demanding a bribe on um, all of these people's live ostensibly and uh, you know it wasn't that she was already playing and um that she was you know, refusing to play rather she had gone to bed and then she was woken up like the composer that we see in the film yeah. and on that scene because that scene is coinciding with the lists of barrier being put out in the streets of moscow and yeah. the nkvd guards going around and rounding up all of these random people and all their family members there's the son turning and his father etc yeah. um I wanted to use this as an interesting segue to talk about the the omnipresence of this this thing which um uh, in which he really wanted to get across, which is that no one in the Soviet Union was safe. Everyone yeah. had a sword of Damocles hanging over them. And this is why I, I, on, on, I can't remember if I've ever said it on this channel, but I was it again. Stalin was able to craft one of the world's most perfect autocracies in the sense because no one was in a privileged position that he couldn't touch them. Everyone was expendable to Stalin. Not only everyone, but the scale of expendability to Stalin is also something awesome to behold. So he has this power, and I want to use this as a way to sort of explain how this links into the story and how music actually has an important political consideration. So we talked about the political implications of Shostakovich, and we talked about the uh, why would a musician fear being rounded up in the dead of night and taken away? Mm. Uh, well, I'm sure, uh, Columbo, you've heard of uh, Lysenko. Yes, he was, the... uh, he was one of the dissidents, wasn't he? No, uh, Lysenko... Lysenko was a uh, Soviet quote unquote um, agronomist uh, who was anti, he was an anti genetics agronomist who believed that agriculture in the Soviet Union could be made to conform with uh, ideological principles. Oh, yes, yes, I know this, but sorry, I was thinking of um, Lomonov. Yeah. And the, the basis of this is the idea of all aspects of Soviet life conforming to the whims of the party. And this idea, which is put across very brilliant in this film, that the party effectively makes truth. And in order to go against the party, you are an enemy, you are a traitor of the people, which is something that you know, essentially personifies Michael Palin's interpretation of Molotov. Well, this was also the case to a lesser extent in the culture sphere. I think after the Second World War, especially domestically, very little is known about what happens to Stalin in the West. We know about the run-up to the Cold War. We know about the consolidation of the Iron Curtain. We know about the you know, reintroduction of uh, common form uh, from the old Communist International. Uh, we know about Schmersch. We know about the Berlin Wall, will be that's not under Stalin, that's under Khrushchev, but nevertheless, the partition of Germany into East and West, which happens, and of course, the creation of the atomic bomb. But domestically, what I find fascinating about the last six, seven, eight, eight or so years of Stalin's life is that there was the potential brewing of a succession struggle and a potential purge going inside it that could have been as 
terrible as everything that you had seen in the Great Purges in the 1930s. And you see little elements of this with the various show trials of the various non-communist officials in the Warsaw Pact countries that are happening this time, as the communists are beginning to consolidate their control over Eastern Europe, because it wasn't instantaneous. We're seeing a process of military occupation from 1944, 1945, to complete and utter political domination from 1947 until 1948. I mean, mentioned things like Bulgaria and Romania still had Tsar and kings until 1947. It wasn't an instantaneous, you know, we were going to mm. invade and we're going to impose communism. And this uh, brewing, this uh, possible succession struggle really focuses on one figure, which I believe is the cultural equivalent, almost like the, um, if Beria, according to Stalin, was the Soviet Goebbels, uh, sorry, Soviet Himmler, then Zhidanov was the Soviet Goebbels. Um, and the reason I focus on him is because he's basically Kirov's successor, Kirov, the original uh, party official who was murdered in 1934 as the head of the Leningrad branch of the family. Well, Zhdanov took over from Kirov and over the next 15 or so years, built up Leningrad, or rather, you know, 10, 12 years, built up Leningrad as his own political power base. And by 1930, 1946, he had declared himself essentially the uh, the cultural ideologue of the Soviet Union with the Zhdanov Doctrine, whereby all elements of Soviet culture, Soviet art, Soviet music, uh, Soviet architecture were to conform with, uh, again, the conception of a universal Soviet ideology, which was also simultaneously completely divorced from supposed capitalist influences. So that's, and, that's, a, that's a challenge to Stalin, right? Uh, no, it's not a challenge to Stalin. Stalin's actively promoting this. Um, Stalin, oh. from 1946 until 1948, I mean, in the, in the same way that Stalin is very much a supporter of Lysenko, Stalin likes this idea of political penetration into all aspects of life, because what does he see this as? He sees this as penetration of party political control into all aspects of everyone's lives. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, a, uh, an agronomist working in an academy of sciences in Moscow, or you're the foreign secretary of the Soviet Union, you still have the sort of Damocles uh, hanging over you for any slight transgression. Albeit by all accounts, uh, Andrei Zhdanov uh, wasn't as ruthless as Lysenko. He was far more moderate. I mean, there is this, uh, again, apocryphal story that uh, Zhdanov in 1948 had Shostakovich, he had Prokofiev, uh, he had uh, Kachaturian, uh, around where he denounced them for so-called formaliz formalism and music and apparently tried to express how to play piano properly <laughs> as ridiculous <laughs> as the sounds so that is the comparison that we have between like it reminds me of the uh <laughs> this the great scene in the film when uh Vasily with the hockey team and he's just screaming play better <laughs> <You know? laughs> well yes yeah, so that that's that's kind of it and uh I mean Shadanov wasn't an idiot he was you know you know, often considered one of the most intelligent uh, officials within the uh, within the Soviet Party, but we don't know as to what extent the Zhdanov doctrine would have evolved, and you know, because he died prematurely. And the reason I'm mentioning this figure of Zhdanov is because it links in from this musical introduction we have in the film, and it goes on to talk about Malenkov and Beria, because from 1946 until 1948, Zhdanov, in, in my opinion, was the most likely person to succeed Stalin, albeit despite being 20 years younger than Stalin, by 1948 his, his health was failing and Malenkov and uh, Beria understood this and they used this as an opportunity to essentially eliminate him and the pretext for eliminating him was the failure of Yugoslavia under Tito to conform with the wishes of Stalin. Essentially, Tito was going his own route in communism, yeah. es establishing a, a independent bloc that would evolve into the non-aligned movement. And um, Zhdanov was basically accused of being responsible for that, even though there was no way that they could have done anything without an invasion. And Malenkov used this an opportunity to eliminate him. Uh, and this is bringing on to Beria who is um, introduced in the film almost as omnipotent in terms of his sphere. He's introduced as the head of the NKVD security forces. And this isn't technically true. And I, I can understand the film a little bit because there are three notorious uh, political, uh, you know, uh, espionage agencies within the Soviet Union that people are no doubt familiar with. One is the Cheka, one is mm -hmm. the NKVD, and one is the KGB. But between, uh, do you think I'm fair saying that, Columba? 
Yeah, yeah, certainly. But between 1946 and 1952, you have this, 1954 rather, you have this weird period where the Soviet constitution is undergoing rapid change. So, for example, in 1952, Stalin actually drops the idea of being general secretary and just uh, assumes the role of council of ministers. The office of chairman of council of ministers hadn't existed since before 1946. Offices like the Sovnikom uh, were abolished and uh, reorganized. And uh, organizations like the Politburo were renamed the Presidium to make all of this much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, Bringing up this um, article by uh, Richard Overy, uh, who wrote on this film, and I have to say that I was very disappointed. Richard Overy really should should know better because Richard Overy is the author of Dictators, which is a comparative biography between Hitler and Stalin, and uh, it's it, you know it was one of my formative sort of books reading about this topic. Nevertheless, I believe that his review of this film was excessively pedantic, and I feel that this pedantic obsession on what I'm going to call Soviet nomenclature <laughs> is something which would actually damage creativity in uh, yeah. filmmaking in terms of trying to synthesize these elements into a way which is digestible for an audience in about I mean, 90 we've, minutes. We've talked about this before i mean i mean you know it's not it's not the end of the world if there are a few um facts played around with as long as they're not absolutely essential if a few dates are played around what matters is the sort of the overall thrust what 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 part of the history they are trying to portray Convey, yeah, and how effectively yeah. they do that right you know I, well, I mean, there's one our, one our last mean. film was an actively you know subversive and hostile attempt where i see whereas i see an, an honest attempt on the part of yeah, yes. what, what we're talking about here is streamlining historical events. I mean, yeah. in terms of my you know, artistic appreciation of the film, there's something very claustrophobic about the death of Stalin. Despite the fact it's based on a graphic novel, because there are no set piece battles or there are no sort of epic scenes, it almost feels like this is a play. It's very much... Yeah. Yeah. It's very much character centered and it's very much based on these small interactions, intense interactions between the individual characters. And because of that, all of these characters are streamlined caricatures of who they really are, especially if your, your intention is to create a comedy film out of this. And um, one thing which I think particularly irked me in reading Richard Overy's uh, historical review of this uh, was his quibble over the fact that uh, Georgi Zhukov, who I have an image here, uh, was called a ma field marshal in the film and not a marshal. And I thought it funny because if Zhukov, is, sorry, if uh, Richard Overy is going to be that pedantic, you might as well mention that the Red Army was actually just called the Soviet Army then when he says, I'm going to represent all the all the Red Army at the funeral. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's a bigger thing to uh, to be frustrated about. But nevertheless, little things like that. He's not the head of the NKVD now. He is the nominal head of both security organizations, the MGB and the MVD. And the reason I mention this, and this is where I think it actually becomes historically pertinent as to the character of Beria, because Beria is, is presented in the film as virtually omnipotent within his sphere, within the sphere of espionage and state policing. Whereas that really isn't the case. And I think because we see so little of Stalin in the film, I think this is almost to the detriment of Stalin's intelligence in terms of why would Stalin give this man who clearly wants to replace him and wouldn't be, you know, <laughs> shed yeah. a tear about killing him? Why would he give him so much power? Of course, Stalin, being an evil genius that he was, wasn't going to allow Beria to just, you know, let him roll over and replace him. Rather, from 1945, Beria is the head of the NKVD. He's forced to give up that position, and he gives it, if my memory is correct, because there are so many names that I have to remember, uh, Sergei Kruglov, uh, who takes over the NKVD, and then the organization, as I mentioned, is separated into two branches, one for security and one for just daily policing as the interior ministry. Mm -hmm. Eventually... Yeah, so, so, but, but, I mean, that in and of itself is important, right, that these institutions, whatever you want to call them, these bodies are being broken up, because that means that... Um, yeah, power, I mean, the, the yeah. more you do, yeah, the more you do that, the less a man can, you know, build his power base upon them. I suppose. Yes, I mean, one of the reasons Albert Speer was so influential in terms of our understanding of the uh, National Socialist Constitution in Germany was because he was able to break down how you had so many officials with overlapping responsibilities. And the effect of having officials with no prescribed authority over a particular area, but with ambiguity in their uh, ministerial mm. makeup, means that you have all of these officials in constant competition with one another to outcompete over the same area. And all yeah. this means 
means essentially is that they are competing with each other and they are not unifying against the leader either it be Adolf Hitler or whether it be Joseph Stalin. And Stalin is using the same policy here because eventually uh, these ministerial positions are filled by um, Abba Kumov, who is a prominent character in the, uh, the first circle and also by Kruglog, as I mentioned. And why do I mention this? Because this gets into the idea of Zhdanov. Um, this is part of the ongoing Soviet struggle. These men were effectively supporters of Zhdanov. And when Zhdanov dies, what do Malenkov and Beria do? They purge all of these officials from the state slowly but surely. They can't immediately get rid of them, but they try and take the Leningrad party, which were allied to um, Janov, and begin the process of eliminating various officials there. And Stalin is really rather terrified of this. And so correspondingly, we actually have a purge orchestrated against, not against uh, Beria's own person, but against Beria's power base, which is the Mingrelian affair, which is very much orchestrated by Stalin to eliminate all the various Georgian officials, because of course, Leverenti Beria is like Stalin, he's from Georgia, uh, who would have necessarily supported him in a potential power gambit against Stalin. So all of this is going on, but all of this is you know, omitted from the film, partly again out of time constraints. You're getting this sort of complexity into the film is virtually impossible. But I think what I want to do here, rather than criticize the film, because I'm, I'm I know I'm asking a lot here, I'm really trying to almost to embellish the film. You know, if you've watched the film, I think you can actually get a lot out of reading the history around it and finding more about the motivations for these figures. I mean, in terms of more pertinent criticisms that you can levy against the film, one is taking away almost all of the initiative of Georgie Malenkov. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just a total fool in the film, isn't he? Yeah, so uh, we'll get more into Malenkov later, but Malenkov historically has more agency and the alliance with Beria isn't that of a sock puppet being controlled by, by Beria, but rather there is a mutual interest. And I think there's Malenkov actually being clever enough to understand rather than he's too stupid to understand what's going on. Malenkov actually understands that there are limitations to his own charisma and his own party power. So he has to rely on alliances rather than doing what Stalin did, which was establish total domineering power over all spheres of influence. And of course, this leads into the direct conflict, which forms the essentially the back, uh, you know, the, the setting for this film, which is the, the I wouldn't even say at the simmering down, because some historians have claimed that the Doctor's plot was virtually all all over. No, I think it wasn't all over. I think it was uh, in <laughs> brewing. I think it was um, gaining serious momentum um, by the time that we reached the the whole sort of uh, basis of this um, of this film, and what essentially was the Doctor's plot? Well, so again, something that really doesn't come across in the film is that there isn't that much talk about it being an explicitly anti-Jewish plot. Um, I might have mm -hmm. missed something. But, um, no, I, 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 thought, I don't think there's um, any mention of that in the film at all, actually. Well, the reason I, I bring this up and why I focused on a figure that doesn't appear at all in the film, Zhanov, is because Zhanov, Beria, and Malenkov, they're all implicated in this. Um, you have a, the, what's her name? I need, I need to remember her name. The, um, the woman who appears and gives evidence and rounds up all the doctors. It's not like Polina or something. No, Polina is the wife. Um, but anyway, anyway, I'll have to look this up quickly. Um, yeah, but Polina's any, Molotov's you, wife. Yeah. Right? Uh, do you have anything to say so far, Columba, on anything I've said? Um, I, I, I'm quite fascinated to, um, um, about this, um, involvement of Beria um, and co in the Doctor's plot because as you say in the film there's not really much hint of that and when they talk about um, um, you know when Stalin's ill and they're talking about getting a doctor they say you know oh well, we, we we got rid of the doctors and there's sort of um, yeah you don't get that you don't get this idea of Beria sort of um, being in any way involved with these people you know he just seems like a sort of a, a, a totally independent character and, and, and as you say far more powerful than um that um, he was in real life. Well, this uh, I just I just found the name, and I do apologize for not knowing it already. Lydia Timoshuk. Um, mm. This is fascinating because this coincides with the last sort of great purge of the of the Soviet era under Stalin. Now, it should come as no surprise to anyone who is aware, you know, familiar with this period. And it's actually going to form the basis of a conversation that I'm going to have with Otto Pohl um, 
next week, which is the forced migrations or really the, you know, forced population resettlements um, of various ethnic groups within the Soviet Union, the Volga Germans, the Germans in Prussia, the Crimean Tatars and the Crimea, all of these groups that were accused of, um, sorry, Columbus, there's a bit of a, oh, sorry, there's, I think there's a car alarm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all of these groups that were accused of collaboration with um, Nazi Germany when you had the invasion from 1941 until 1945. Um, for example, when the Germans, these groups were taken away from the Volga regions and they were resettled in Central Asia. And of course, the similar thing to the Crimean Tatars. And it's still only now we see elements of the Crimean Tatars slowly beginning to return uh, to what is now the Russian annexed uh, Crimea post uh, 2014. And it's possible because we talk about um, Zionism and we talk about the creation of a Jewish home state in, 1940, in 1948. But in the 1920s, because again, there was a considerable Jewish influence on the Soviet leadership, all the way in East Russia, next, very near Vladivostok, you actually have a autonomous Jewish oblast within the Soviet yeah, Union. Yes, I've heard about this. Yeah. Which is a Jewish administered state. And the reason I bring this up is because we talk about Paulina, uh, we talk about Zhanov, all of these, the reason I'm bringing up all of this is because all of this is interconnected and really forms the background for the film. Um, you have the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Throughout the war, Stalin had used and relied on an organization called the Union of uh, Jewish Anti-Fascists, mm -hmm. uh, which was used to bring up collective support for the Soviet Union in their war effort against Nazi Germany. Um, all of these various elements in the film, and from 1947, 1948, Stalin and the collective leadership begins deposing of various Jewish cultural figures and Jewish political leaders. And Zionism, for at least in my mind, is almost the last nail in the coffin because Stalin was under the assumption that in terms of his support for Jews throughout the war and his support of Jews, even after Trotsky, and there was, a, again, a lingering element of anti-Semitism anti and Stalin's thought because of the influence of Trotsky. But when you have the creation of the Jewish state in 1948, Stalin's assumption is that this is a form of Jewish betrayal because mm. the state of Israel doesn't go over to become part of the Eastern Bloc. And you have a mass exodus of Russian Jews who go over and uh, yeah. facilitate the creation of the state of Israel, and they are not Soviet aligned. Because so there, now, was, there, there was a sort of, um, you know, a tension between West and East in um, in palestine or in you know um, what would become israel and there was that sort of um yes the idea that they could sort of go either way if you know what i mean yes and stalin believed from his point of view that they should align with the soviet bloc and so from 1948 to 1949 he again he interpreted his state of paranoia he believed that this was a form of failure and this relate, relates back to Paulina because Paulina who was the wife of Molotov Vladislav Molotov the foreign secretary received Golda Meir who was then later become prime minister of Israel but was then the first ambassador of Israel to the Soviet Union and the idea essentially from Stalin's point of view is that Paulina who was a Jew was communicating in Yiddish they were conspiring with mm. Golda Meir to instigate some sort of plot against the Soviet Union. Again, there's a huge amount of historical discrepancy over this as to whether this was an intentional ploy by Stalin or as to whether you know, it was entirely fabricated. One sort of thing that leans on this idea that it was fabricated is because Stalin could not sort of name an obvious successor. There couldn't be one person who he promoted over all others because then you almost certainly created a target on your back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think even if you notice this in modern days, if you notice modern politicians like uh, Theresa May or Angela Merkel trying to promote Amber Rudd or Cramp Karen Bauer <laughs> to be their supposed successor, not only do their own political demises quickly ensue, but the supposed successor is often quickly eliminated as well. Yeah. So this doesn't happen the way you want it. I mean, they've always of been- Of course, I mean, there's no um there's no moral or religious or philosophical constraints as well you know there's no um there's no air it's uh it's just a mess so with this again we from this we see the first of all the attack on the union of jewish anti-fascists then this goes on and talk takes on a medical air now what is the pretext for this we talked about the death of janov janov died prematurely as was as ostensibly a result of heart failure his doctor, 
Zhanov's doctor was accused by uh, Timashuk of potentially, I believe, poisoning him or being responsible for his death. And when various, I think it was another Soviet official, also died as a result of care under a Jewish doctor, um, you begin to see this hysterical um, campaign within the echelons of the Soviet ministries to label Jews, um, Jewish doctors in particular, as wanting to murder, poison various Soviet officials. Mm -hmm. Not directly at, um, aimed at Stalin, but from 1951 to 1952, there is one particular figure called uh, Mikhail Rumin, who was also mentioned in the uh, the, the the first um, circle by uh, uh, by um, Oh, my, so my, my, thank you. <laughs> so, so many Russian <laughs> okay, names. Okay. Um, and uh, this actually, interestingly, this is why I talk about you know, barrier, get involved in this barrier, being responsible for this in terms of the complete friction and no one having idea, any idea what's going on. Uh, there are many reasons for barrier to lean on this plot. One is that it diverts attention away from the Stalin induced plot against him, the Mingrelian affair, trying to eliminate various mm. Georgian officials who are accused of Western uh, collaboration, uh, Western being, being compromised by various capitalist associates. And um, therefore, when we talk about one particular figure who was very enthusiastic about persecuting Jewish uh, doctors, Mikhail Rumin. Um, he seems to be a lone operative until um, he seems to be collaborating with Malenkov and by extension with Beria to hype up the investigation to implicate his superior, um, Abakumov, who I mentioned was the deputy for Beria within that department who had aligned with Zhanov. I know this is sounding very complicated, but the point is this was used to eliminate a Beria opponent from one of his former ministries to take back that power. And then you see the instigation, you, you can say the expansion of that power to not only talk about specific Jewish doctors, but talk about a specific plot by the Jewish doctors, which was unleashed in Pravda in the first few months of 1953 to target Stalin in particular and lead this poisoning campaign. And so who, from who, my... Who would, um, who would sort of... Who would have been in charge of, of Pravda? You know, was there a sort of editor or, you know, who, who would have that <laughs> control? In terms of the leadership of Pravda, I mean, it's often headed by some sort of high-ranking Soviet official. In terms of the actual sort of editorship of Pravda, then I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, but the administration, the control of Pravda is absolutely essential because it is the official communist paper. Well, it's the, the truth, Soviet isn't Union. it? Within this, uh, the, again, it's the delineation of the, of the party line. Now, it's interesting because the implications from here are had Beria actually been supporting the uh, the doctor's plot in terms of trying to expand this, we could have seen this expand not only into a, a general sort of um, anti-Jewish purge throughout the Soviet Union that could have involved massive um, really. Uh, settlement relocations of all Soviet Jews from the various municipalities in the Soviet Union and then relocating to the already established Jewish Autonomous Zone. But this could have been extended to act as some sort of anti-factionalist purge throughout the entirety of the Soviet Union in 1953. It's interesting to see as to whether Beria could have essentially, you know, ridden on, ridden on the tide of that in order to eliminate his various, you know, uh, opponents mm. such as Khrushchev, such as Molotov and the well, lingering elements I mean, that's of... Um, how... I mean, that's how these things work. I mean, the, the the Great Purge, it's sort of, um, you know, you go through stages and sort of mounting ever-increasing levels of hysteria. You know, you don't just or, go from not to 100, do you? Or Stalin could have used that and then done the same thing to bury what he did to Yeshov and just used it Indeed. as an to, to claim that he was power-hungry and Bonapartist and uh, uh, counter-revolutionary and ultimately to eliminate him. So it's within this political context that we arrive at the, the self-styled comedy of terrors um, which is the the actual uh, death of Stalin. And I have a, another segment here. This time, this is from Khrushchev's memoirs. Um, you can take uh, Khrushchev's uh, you know, memoirs. It's not, you know, not, not, not perhaps a very impartial text. With a grain of salt. But the reason I selected this is one of the first, um, one of the very few first-hand accounts of this period that we have in its entirety. Um, of course, it was written in 1970, somewhat to exonerate himself, but also to uh, act as a little stab against the Brezhnev leadership that had uh, taken over, because, of course, Khrushchev had been deposed in 1964, not killed, yeah, just deposed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But nevertheless, I think this is also doubly appropriate because the film almost makes Khrushchev into a, into a sort of 
protagonist as much as you can say that. And just a, a little bit of a background on Khrushchev, again, assuming that people know nothing about him. Um, Khrushchev was a very unlikely man to take up the reins of power after Stalin died. Um, he was sort of ranked as the least important member of the presidium um, in Western papers after the death of Stalin. Uh, very much was assumed that the power was being wielded by Malenkov, by Molotov, and by Beria, Beria in particular. But Khrushchev had been one of the other figures you see in the film, which he's not so important in the film, but their relationship is conveyed enough in order to get it across, is Lazar Kaganovich. Um, of course, Columba Lazar Kaganovich was responsible for much of the, you know, the, the, the various famines that we see in the Ukraine in the 1930s. Mm. And throughout the 1930s, he was the most powerful man in Ukraine, and he was seen as another candidate to be Stalin's successor. Thereafter, he was responsible for much of the Soviet transportation system as basically commissar for trains. Nevertheless, by the 1940s, he was quickly you know, out, outshone, and his protege, was one Nikita Khrushchev, who very much came throughout the Second World War and afterwards to dominate the old stomping ground of Kaganovich in Ukraine, essentially becoming his party boss, despite and not he, being um, ethnically uh, Ukraine. He, he fought in the Ukraine. war, didn't he, Khrushchev? Well, well, no, he was a political commissar. If you can... ah, so he was <laughs> shooting people running away from the war. <laughs> if, if, you can, uh, if you can say that. He was at Stalingrad. Um, but he wasn't leading the Soviet army at Stalingrad. He was the chief political officer at the Battle of Stalingrad. Well, I hope he didn't make jokes about Stalingrad like he makes in the film. <laughs> well, that's another interesting thing we, we can get to slightly, just a, a little omission there. Um, so th this is the background for him. And within this context, which I've set up about this bitter succession struggle going on and Stalin possibly directing this against Beria and Beria trying to wheedle out all of these potential rivals before we get to the scene, in the film where he almost seems you know, all powerful even though it definitely wasn't the situation for him historically uh we have khrushchev um khrushchev was brought in to be he's labeled as the party boss in moscow in the film and that's basically correct he was the party boss in ukraine he comes over to moscow at stalin's insistence almost to be a counterweight to these uh, uh very powerful officials jockeying mm -hmm to replace Stalin. And of course, Stalin is, I mean, one of the wonderful things Stalin does, which doesn't appear at all in the film, is in 1952, we mentioned all of these uh, naming conventions and the nomenclature being removed and him to getting rid of the title of general secretary, which also corresponds to Malenkov as well. Um, he also appoints something like 20 members to the presidium. So not only are you having more members being brought into it, but a lot more members brought into it. All of yeah. a sudden, the inner circle is widening and all of a sudden Malenkov and Beria are faced with more high-ranking party officials that they have to navigate through in order to eliminate. And of course it makes Stalin's position stronger. relatively stronger, yeah. Yes, having having more men who are less compared to fewer men who are considerably stronger. And Khrushchev is effectively one of these men from the late 1940s throughout the early 50s. I mean, you know, he tries to introduce some sort of moderation of the collectivization of farmland in the Moscow region, which doesn't go very well. But mainly he's known for putting up very shoddy housing during his time as the party <laughs> boss. Uh, those, uh, uh, those, they're essentially called Khrushchev slums. Those, uh, uh, those multi-story buildings, the, the tiny sort of cramped um, apartment blocks that we'll later see in this country in the 1960s, just spread throughout the Soviet Union, which mm. people are still living in today, as they are in this country. But um, he's mainly known for that. He doesn't sort of make great waves, so he's not expected to be one of the main contenders for power. And this is his account of the death of Stalin. Stalin was suddenly taken sick in February of 1953. How did this happen? We had all been at his place on Saturday. This was after the 19th Party Congress, when Stalin was already weighing in the balance the fates of Mikoyan and Molotov. Mikoyan is the Minister of International Trade, as portrayed in the film, and he's also portrayed by Paul Whitehouse. He doesn't really have um, any character in the film he's basically a comic relief character that and bulganin <laughs> for, for some reason they had to form some sort of comedy double act which uh, khrushchev goes up against <laughs> um I, I can i can understand that because more characters you know diluting this making this more complicated i mean the one thing it doesn't sort of represent in the film is how mikoyan along with molotov 
was having his life threatened. That doesn't come across at all in the film. If anything, he appears a doctrinaire Stalinist when McCoyan actually becomes a pivotal deputy to Khrushchev in the post-Stalinist thaw period. That doesn't really come across, but again, for this whole sort of period, he's actually not that much of an influential figure. There is one figure who is completely omitted, which is Clement Voroshilov, uh, which I can, again, forgive because Voroshilov was always known mm -hmm. as a temp as a figurehead rather than actually a man who actually made any uh, I mean, significant I mean, I think, power I, I, moves. I think another important thing is, um, um, I mean, especially in a comedy, brevity, because, um, you know, comedies are usually short, right? You never have a really, really long comedy. It very rarely works. You need to keep it sort of um, punchy, don't you? So, um, again, uh, you have to let a lot of stuff slide when you consider what the director is going for and what he's trying to do. Yes, exactly. And I think this needs to, again, I'm not advocating for, because this isn't a documentary. This is a tragedy farce. Yeah. Um, I do like that term, comedy of terrors. That's quite yes, good. It, it is quite good. No, and the, the little one line is he does come across. I, 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 lo, he does look, interestingly enough, I don't believe he does look like Steve Buscemi, but there is a weirdness to both of them mm. in terms of their, their physical appearance. I can't quite I don't know. I, 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 see, I see similarities in the ears. Yeah. Um, but the time, the time portrayal of Khrushchev, I think, is very flattering. He doesn't look at all like that. <laughs> I was very happy to get all of these uh, time covers with the potential Stalin successors. I've got more of them. Anyway, at the very first plenum after the Congress, he proposed, and again, this is the um, uh, the 19th Party Congress, he proposed that a presidium of the Central Committee be established instead of a Politburo to consist of 25 members, that he gave the names of many new people. I and other members of the Politburo were surprised. We wondered how this list had been drawn up and by whom. After all, Stalin didn't know these people. So who was it that helped him? Even today, I don't know exactly. I asked Malenkov, but he answered that he himself didn't know. Because of the post he held, Malenkov should have taken part in the formation of the Presidium, the selection of people, the compiling of the list, but he hadn't been allowed to be a part of it. And of course, Malenkov is Stalin's de deputy, is the, uh, essentially the deputy prime minister of the Soviet Union. Perhaps Stalin did it all on his own. Today, I'm guessing, from various indications, that he made use of Kaganovich's assistance and selected the new caddies. Within the Presidium, a narrow body would be operating the Bureau. In fact, no sessions of the Presidium were held at the time. Instead, all questions were decided by the Bureau. Stalin dreamed up this body, which was not to provide for all at, at all under the party rules. Why did Stalin create this Bureau of the Presidium? Evidently, he felt uncomfortable about kicking Molotov and Mikurin out right away, and so he created an expanded presidium and then chose a bureau for a more restricted nature. This was the, for the purposes of operational day-to-day -day leadership, as he said, and he didn't include Molotov or Mikurin in this body, and he essentially said he left them hanging. I am convinced that if Stalin had lived longer, the lives of Molotov and Mikoyan would have ended catastrophically. And um, in general, how this is actually portrayed in the film, Molotov is portrayed as actually having attended the last cinema viewing with Stalin and the other members of the inner circle. In all likelihood, he wasn't there. He would have been there perhaps a couple of months earlier, but he wouldn't have been there on that night. And he wouldn't have been there right as he was put on the list. And the whole idea of him being put on the list, again, is following in this line which is Khrushchev's uh, argumentation that he had fallen out of favor. And this wasn't actually the first time that Molotov had fallen out of favor. I'll bring Molotov up again by uh, Michael Palin. Again, a, uh, a very sort of true to life in, in terms of image rendering. I do think uh, perhaps a little thinner in the face, but I think Michael Palin does look very similar. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. To, uh, I love I love this portrait from time. What mm -hmm. What is happening here? Yes. He's, he's dressed like a sort of, I don't know, 1930s pimp or something. <laughs> a red, a, the red pimp. And, <laughs> anyway, um, so he had, as we mentioned, been involved with Polina. Polina had been implicated with Golda Meir and therefore as part of the grand sort of anti-Semitic conspiracy that was going on in the Soviet Union. And it's under that those auspices that Polina was put away and arrested as, as part of this campaign against the Jews, but also against Molotov personally, because Stalin went through various iterations of liking Molotov and disliking Molotov. I personally believe that Stalin would have, again, potentially favored or seen Molotov as a potential successor. Um, for many reasons, Molotov had many qualities. Molotov was 
seen as colourless, he was seen as the consummate bureaucrat, but he was very effective at being Stalin's deputy. Often when you, because of course he was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union during World War II and the early stages of the Cold War, when you hear accounts of Molotov, you know, people are often, you know, dismayed by him. He's basically considered a stern school teacher dressing down all the ambassadors around him and then carrying away desperate to get sort of Stalin's approval on the line. Mm. Um, so you have this interesting dichotomy in terms of him being a very effective yes man. But one of the political Political implications of this. It's not that he's a yes man to Stalin so much as he's also being um, dominated by his wife Paulina at the same time, who is not just his wife, she's very much a consummate politician in her own right and that's what Stalin fears and one of the reasons why Stalin is prepared to oust Molotov. Nevertheless, Molotov had been removed from his position of Foreign Secretary in 1949 and in terms of trying to understand why the film presents him as Foreign Secretary, I think it's a bit jarring perhaps again to convey him as Foreign Secretary in 1949 and then have him immediately re reassume the role of Foreign Secretary after Stalin's death. I think, again, it's in terms of conveying who he is effectively to the audience, whilst also giving the impression that his life is in the balance. I think the film does get that across without being yeah. incredibly pedantic and in saying that he had already undergone a continued sort of downfall since 1948, 1949, and now his life was hanging by a thread. Yeah, I, I mean, this idea of him being sort of... Um colorless it is interesting because you know i was reading about um you know these sort of accounts of when his wife was taken away and um it might have been khrushchev but a couple of them essentially asked you know like why, why, why don't you do something why are you letting her get arrested and he just sort of you know steely faced said you know I, I have to go with the will of the party or something like that it's just it, it, it it's incredible it's very unnerving to see just how how, just how inhuman people can become, you know? It's yes, in, in fairness, it, it, but again, in terms of height and caricatures, there was an aspect that he, again, was like that, but not to that extent. He yeah. loved Paulina, and the first thing he was, again, quoted as saying when Stalin died and referenced what would happen to Paulina was, I want Paulina back. It wasn't, yeah. I'm glad she's dead, which is the impression yeah. that we get in the film. I mean, wasn't it like, um, it was like Beria, um, they, were, they sort of offered him something as a birthday present, so the story mm. goes, yeah. Well, but again, it's just, you know, why do this? And I feel that um, the film tries to almost consolidate various themes about the Soviet Union and its political makeup. I mean, one of the reviews, um, which I read, if I can try and find it, which was, I thought, completely ridiculous, um, which is, just give me a second, Samuel Goff, uh, writing in the Calvert Journal, uh, essentially claimed that the film completely missed the point and that it didn't do anything to try and tackle the implications of the Soviet political system. Now, this is complete rubbish because <laughs> Michael Palin almost... How can you even say I, I, that? I, I know. Michael Palin almost personifies this because his character is almost reduced to the caricature of the idea that the party is an organ of truth and therefore he is its apparition. It needs to believe in this idea, you know, completely yeah there's like there's like the sort of uh the politburo scene isn't there where they're all having their meeting and he goes off on this spiel yes but the spiel is actually important you know nothing in this film is effectively wasted because he talks about this concept of anti-factionism he talks about this idea of democratic centralism he discusses how stalin can be faithful to the party these may sound ridiculous to us but within the logic of the soviet constitution it actually makes sense and you and do Palin... get that hammered away i mean when they're deciding sort of um um i think what to do with the whether or not they should get a doctor or but they're deciding to off someone um i think it's mylon he says you know look we work better as a committee and it's sort of you know it's it's comedic but again they are trying to get at that um that sentiment that was there as well so yes it's, but it's very this, artfully done it's artfully done but i think this again as with all of these things but again remember this is a a comedy film this is your 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 caricaturing elements of the soviet bureaucratic system and you're trying to caricature the character as well. And as a result, inevitably, you're going to lose nuance. And that is the effect with uh, with Palin's character. So back to where we talk about Khrushchev and the, the night of the death. On Saturday, February the 28th, 1953, he called us, Stalin, to the Kremlin. He invited Malenkov, Beria, Bulganin, and me. We went, he said, let's watch a movie. We watched it. Then he said, as usual, let's go have something to eat near my dacha. We went and had supper. The meal dragged on for a long time. Stalin called this kind of meal dinner. That was very late at night. It was probably five or six in the morning when we finished. That was the usual time when his dinners ended. 
Stalin was a bit tipsy and seemed very well disposed toward everyone. Nothing indicated that anything unexpected might happen. When he went out of the vestibule, Stalin accompanied us as usual. He joked a lot, waved his hands around, and as I recall, he poked me in the stomach with a finger and called me Bikita, the Ukrainian iteration of my name. <laughs> we said goodbye and left. We too were in a good mood when we left because nothing unpleasant had happened at dinner. Not all of these dinners ended that well. We all went home, and of course there are indications, implications, which are in the scene of that film, because all of this is portrayed correctively, even down to the fact that he would record his jokes for posterity, and he would spend yeah, the gonna... entire night um, relaying this to his wife and ensuring that every one of his jokes effectively landed and make sure not to repeat the same mistake. I was going, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. No, this is this, and this is one of the caricatures. If anything, it suited him very well politically. It gave him a reason to stick around in the inner circle because he made Stalin laugh, but also it made him appear like a clown to all of his competitors, which kind of like um, the Emperor Claudius. Yeah, it's a bit like I Claudius. You know, you're a fool, so <laughs> you, Claudius, you, you can never, yeah, cr 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 Khrushchev, you can never, um, <laughs> be, you can never be expected to be emperor. And uh, if the Sybil says so, then the Sybil's an idiot. <laughs> uh, so, yes, there was a, an interesting implication of that. But, of, co of course, there are insinuations made in the film during that dinner. Um, there was the reference to a former, again, obviously deceased comrade, which uh, causes Malenkov to almost assume that his life is um, on the line. Th there is a weird element in the film which I can't quite understand. They have so many names, hundreds of thousands of names they can use for oft officials in the Soviet Union, yet they invented two, Polnikov and Kupaczynski, and I wonder why. Mm. I'm trying to remember what part of the film this happens in. Yes, Polnikov is the... The, the so-called, you know, when they're having the joke and that uh, he, Khrushchev is talking about putting your hand in water causes them to piss themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how we, we prank this on Polnikov. Oh, yeah. And then, and then um, uh, yeah. And then he sort of asks what where he yeah, is now. Well, yeah, whatever, was... whatever happened. Of, yeah. Mm. Yeah, anyway. Do you want to know what happened to fucking Polnikov? You really want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love, that's another thing I adore about this film is it does get across the sort of, um, you know, Stalin's sort of working class, quite rough nature at times. You know, I, I love the scene when um, um, the the officer is delivering the, and you know, the officer speaks, oh, yeah. in, speaks, speaks into you. Know, why why'd you, why'd you take so long? You fucking walk. Yeah, you fucking walk. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I love that. But I do think that was also, um, and again, I'm not an expert, but I would assume that that would have been part of Stalin's appeal as well, right? That, that um, you know, you, you might have played that up at times, uh, sort of the working class. So. I, I, I mean, don't that would know. Make sense I, mean, to me. I mean, a large factor of, you can say his ostracization and why people didn't take him seriously in the beginning was because he was this rustic provincial from Georgia compared to these, you know, again, Intellectuals, a, a word, yeah. a word that comes out a lot in the doctor's plot and the, the general sort of anti-Jewish tirade in the last few years of the Stalin regime is rootless cosmopolitan. And it's <laughs> yeah. something which can be perhaps referenced to Leon Trotsky. It's this idea of the sophisticated uh, polyglot um, communist official as encapsulated in someone like Trotsky. Stalin, again, was completely the antithesis of that. And, and you can see how that would come into Stalin's, again, the sort of the nationalistic view, right, of sort of, you know, we're rooted um, as opposed to this um, international conception. Yes, you know, and one could argue that's possibly a reason as to why he went back on the idea of indigenization and focused less on cosmopolitan culture and more towards a russified uh, Soviet culture from the late 1930s onwards, and why this was, again, opposed by people like Khrushchev. Um, nevertheless, I mean, one of the things that comes across about Stalin in particular is his complete charisma void. Uh, he wasn't a very good speaker. Uh, you know, even uh, Yudina, when she sees the uh, the body in state, one of the things she mentioned, he's so small. He was very short. I think it was about five foot five, five foot four. Yeah, um, yeah. It doesn't really come across in, you know, any of the photos unless you're seeing him actually speak to people. Um, of course, it always helps that uh, FDR is always in a wheelchair. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Churchill was also tiny. And, so. Yes, and Churchill was also tiny. So there were elements that he completely lacked charisma and that he was just this functionary. He was just this bureaucrat who went around and was able to be industrious. He was able to do the jobs that no one else wanted to do, but nevertheless couldn't see the political potential of doing them. And 
I don't really think that endeared him really to anyone. I think it made him almost a consummate outsider. There isn't a little element which I enjoy. I think, again, it's more being English than necessarily this being an accurate portrayal of Russian. It's the fact that Svetlana and Vasily, the children of Stalin, clearly have correct uh, received pronunciation. Yeah. And again, this is a little act of, you know, new money rising up and then educating mm -hmm. your kids properly. So just a little element like that you might have missed and might have been lost and say, for example, some American viewers, it's quite interesting that they actually paid attention and they have those accents in complete contrast yeah. to the rustic father. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I think some Americans would be aware of that. I mean, it's sort of an old, an old. Oh, I said, some, oh, I said some, that. some Americans. I didn't want to uh, hashtag not all. <laughs> So where was I? Right. My expectation was that since the next day was uh, a day off, Stalin would surely call us, and therefore I didn't eat all day. I thought he might call up a little earlier than usual. Then I finally did have something to eat, because although I kept waiting and waiting, there was no phone call. I couldn't believe he would let us have our day off to all, all to ourselves. That thing kind of barely ever happened. But no, there was, a there was no phone call. It got to be late at night, and I undressed and went to bed. Suddenly Malenkov called me. I just had a phone call from this fellow that is Stalin's bodyguard. He mentioned the names of several of the che uh, Czechists at Stalin's dacha, said they were reporting with concern that something had happened to Stalin. We should go there immediately. I'm calling you now, and I've already informed Belia and Bulganin. Bulganin, of course, is the uh, defense secretary, the actual head of the Soviet army compared to... Um, Zhukov will get into later. You better head out there right away. I immediately called for a vehicle. I was at my dacha. I quickly got dressed and went to Stalin's dacha. It took about 15 minutes in all to get there. We agreed that we wouldn't go into Stalin's room, but it would go, uh, but would go uh, speak to the people on duty. We went and asked what's going on, they said. Usually Stalin calls us by this time of night around 11 o'clock without fail. He calls us and asks for tea. Sometimes he has something to eat. Tonight this didn't happen. We sent Martyona Petrovna, one of his waitresses, in to see him. She was not a young woman. She had worked for Stalin for many years. And although she was a limited person, she was loyal and devoted. The Czechs told us um, they had sent for her, um, sent her in to see what was going on. She said that Comrade Stalin was lying on the floor, sleeping, and the floor around him was wet. The Czechs lifted him and put him on a couch in the small dining room. There was a large dining room and a small one there. Stalin had been lying on the floor in the large dining room. This meant that he must have gotten out of his bed, gone into the large dining room, and then fallen down and wet himself. When they told us what had happened, and that he now seemed to be sleeping, we thought that since he was in such poor shape, it would be awkward for us to appear at his side and make our presence officially known, so we went back to our homes. A short time later, the phone rang again. It was Malenkov. The fellows at Comrade Stalin's dacha have called again. They're saying there's something wrong with him after all. Although Matilya Petrovna said uh, he was sleeping peacefully, his sleep isn't normal. We should go there again. We agreed that Malenkov would call all the other members of the bureau, including Voroshilov and Kaganovich, and um, who had not been there at the dinner and had not gone to Stalin's dacha the first time. We agreed also to call the doctors. Again, we went to speak with the people who were on duty. Kaganovich, Voroshilov, and the doctors arrived. I remember the name of one of the doctors. He was well-known cardiologist, Professor Lukonsky. So there's a sort of a lot to unpack there. And what we see in the film is all of that being compact. So Khrushchev talks about two nights of sort of ongoing. And again, they're not sort of being aware of the implications of this. One of the implications, of course, is that Beria was aware of this and he was trying to delay getting a doctor as long as possible. That isn't really yeah. the betrayal we get in the film. Uh, the betrayal we get in the film is, well, very much that um, uh, whilst he's appreciative and he knows the body's there, um, he doesn't want to call a doctor, obviously, but this is not all the fault of Beria. Rather, yeah, without just a Stalin sort of there... bureaucratic mess, isn't it? Yes, without Stalin there, there is no central decision-making process anymore. So we need to convene the central committee in order to organize some form of effective response. And doesn't it flash up like a couple of articles where it says like you know if the leader is incapacitated the yes, committee will the, be convened the, and, the, yeah. proper, the proper constitution and then of course you have funny moments and that like who carries the head well you're the acting general secretary you carry <laughs> yeah, the head yeah. <laughs> shuffling through the hall with them yeah little elements and them appealing again to this uh this form of collective leadership of course the um the deviation of course is there is a lot more political sort of hammering on about uh, involving Lydia Timoshuk again, who goes off and uh, rounds up a bunch of doctors. There were many doctors there, um, including the one which uh, 
uh, Khrushchev just referenced, who was uh, Likomsky, uh, who is essentially the only named uh, doctor in this. And again, that, that more or less plays out and he's diagnosed with a, cere a cerebral hemorrhage. Um, there are some sort of, I guess, notable deviations and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them. But obviously, you know, she doesn't play in this. And the reason why these doctors were rounded up and Stalin had no doctor was again part of the doctor's plot and why, you know, Stalin believed that possibly a Jewish doctor was out there to poison him. Uh, the official sort of pretext for this was that his doctor had told Stalin to take a break from work and have a rest. And Stalin, being Stalin, um, remembered what had happened to Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, of course, had had a series of strokes, debilitating strokes from 1922. Stalin himself had had a stroke in 1945, and of course had gone on, continued working and aggressively trying to rule over and dominate the Soviet Union. Yeah. But he also understood that in that time of incapacity, when Lenin was unable to rule the Soviet Union as premier of Sovnikom from, 90, from 1922 until 1924, that he effectively ruled the Soviet Union with the Troika of Kamenev and Zinoviev. So he believed the doctor telling him to take a break and get some rest was, if anything, a political ploy to remove him from power and allow mm. for someone else to officially take over under the pretext of Stalin's ill health. Now, that may sound very far-fetched, but we are talking about Stalin here. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound that far-fetched. I mean, you know, what is it... Um... What is it that Tacitus says about the imperial power? He says it's like holding a wolf by the ears. You know, you don't yes. like holding it, but you don't dare let it go. Yeah. Some other medical expert showed up along with him, but I don't remember their names. We went into the room. Stalin was lying on the couch. We told the doctors to do their duty and find out what condition Comrade Stalin was in. Lekomsky went, uh, went up to him first, very cautiously, and I understood his behavior. He touched Stalin's hand as though it was a hot iron. He was even trembling. Beria then said rudely, you're a doctor. Take hold of his hand good and proper the way you're supposed to. The Kromsky said that Stalin's right arm was not functioning. His left leg was paralyzed and he was unable to speak. His condition was very bad. They cut away his clothing, dressed, up, dressed him up in pajamas, carried him into the large dining room and laid him on the couch there, where he continued to sleep, but there was more air. We decided there and then to have the doctors remain in attendance on him. We members of the Presidium Bureau also established an arrangement by which some of us would remain present. Um, by the way, this is, a, again, a really sort of um, trivial point to make in terms of Soviet nomenclature in the film, but they weren't the Central Committee. The Central Committee is a lot much larger body, and they were officially the Presidium Bureau. The select mm. members of the Presidium now have been expanded so rapidly, as we alluded to earlier. We divided up the duties as follows. Beria and Malenkov would be on duty together, then Kaganovich and Voroshilov, and then Bulganin and me. I do wonder actually why, because again, Bulganin and um, uh, Paul Whitehouse's character, sorry, I do have to remember the name, Mikoyan, play such minor roles. I wonder why Voroshilov wasn't even there, not even having to say anything, but just having an actor there who maybe you know, had one one-liner. <laughs> It's interesting mm -hmm. that of all the characters they decided to omit Voroshilov because technically after the death of Stalin, he was nominally the head of state of the Soviet Union as the head of the presidium of the Supreme Soviet. But I mean, I suppose I suppose he's less well known, right? I mean, they try and go for the people like Molotov, like Khrushchev, that I don't you know, know. people have um, some familiarity with. I, I think I think Voroshilov is perhaps better known than Bulganin and Mikoya and perhaps even Kaganovich. Mm -hmm. Um because Voroshilov was such an enduring figure within the Soviet Union, like I said, I mean, he was the defense minister before World War I for about 10 years. He was one of the first marshals of the Soviet Union. You know, he survived and Tukhachevsky was eliminated. So it's a real hanger on. Yeah. Uh, him and uh, Budyonny, the uh, the great cavalry enthusiast, who was uh, one of Stalin's favorite generals. Whilst Tukhachevsky was talking about mechanized warfare, Budyonny was talking about uh, cavalry detachments to be used against the Germans, but there you are. <laughs> The ones who mainly decided these things were Malenkov and Beria. They chose the daytime assignments for themselves, while Boganin and I got up late, uh, late night duty. I felt very upset. I confessed that I regretted we might lose Stalin, whose condition was now so serious. Doctors said that a person with this kind of illness hardly ever returned to work. A person might continue to live, but it was unlikely that he would be capable of working. Most often this kind of illness was of short duration and ended in catastrophe. We could see that Stalin was lying there unconscious, with no awareness of the condition he was in. 
They began to feed him a bullion sweet tea with a spoon. The doctors gave these orders to help him urinate, but he still didn't move. I noticed they were taught. Uh, I think I'll skip over this and just try and find. This Did they section. not even? Um, I'm pretty sure they even applied leeches, didn't they? Let me just read this. Because, they helped um, him urinate, but he didn't move. I noticed that when they were taking his urine, it seemed as though he tried to cover himself, feeling embarrassment. That meant that he was aware of something. One afternoon, Stalin regained consciousness. It was evident from the expression on his face, but he still couldn't speak. He raised his left hand and began pointing either at the ceiling or at the wall. And again, this is a quite a funny moment in the film where he's, <laughs> yeah, where he's, it's he's like the lamb, from, yeah. uh, talking about you know the lamb and the the, the, the tit of socialism. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's the milk. <laughs> Maybe all the tit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so good. I gave him my hand and he shook mine with his left hand. His right arm wasn't functioning. He was trying to convey his feelings by shaking hands. Then I said, do you know what he's pointing at, at that picture? There was a reproduction of the painting by some artist hanging in the wall. It might have been a clip of the uh, magazine Ogonyok. It showed a young girl feeding a lamb from a bottle where comrade Stalin was feeding with a spoon. And apparently he's trying to show us, pointing at the picture and smiling. And he's trying to say, look, I'm in the same position as the lamb as soon as Stalin collapsed. And again, that is a detail which is so easy to omit from a film, but the fact that that's taken verbatim out of Khrushchev's memoirs and incorporated in that film, I'm sorry, it just shows a conscientiousness and a fidelity to the source material that is so lacking in yeah. other historical films. And you can say what you want about the, the various elements we've been talking about in terms of rushed character development and synthesizing all of these historical elements and playing down the huge uh, political sort of uh, almost Armageddon that's been going on, uh, especially around the character of Beria. But nevertheless, it's so easy to avoid that, but to take that and being able to effectively utilize it and make it a punchline of a comedic joke, I think is genius. Yeah, it's brilliant. He, I mean, he's a very talented man. I mean, you know, I, I, I love his other work as well. But um, yeah, re reading about the treatments, I mentioned that there, um, um, they actually did apply leeches. Um, they did this multiple times. And apparently the reason is um because he had a cerebral hemorrhage, right? Um, and the, the idea was, as you say, overwork, you know, Stalin had a very, very high blood pressure, which is quite understandable. And so the idea was, if you drain his blood with leeches, you can lower his blood pressure, which, um, I mean, actually sounds quite, quite reasonable, to be honest. I mean, you know, they, they have a bad rap these days, but they can, um, <laughs> leech, leech, no, leeching someone can. No, happen. no, no, I agree. I, I agree with you. I'm just, I'm just laughing at the idea that leeches have had a bad rap. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. Damn it. <laughs> As soon as Stalin collapsed, Beria began opening, show, openly showing his anger and hostility toward him. He cursed him and made fun of him. It was impossible to listen to. It's also interesting that the moment Stalin regained consciousness and it seemed that he might recover, Beria threw himself on his knees beside him, grabbed his hand and began to kiss it. And again, this is I, I've seen another film adaptation which covers the entire life of Stalin which has this element incorporated into it very faithfully but it's interesting how the film chose to omit this and make Beria a much more imposing figure than this again this uh, you, you, you can say this uh, chameleon-esque character who shifts and changes depending on the political situation of course there's an element with uh, Simon Beale's portrayal of Beria but uh, nothing is pathetic as that where he would kowtow, he would demean himself openly. Rather in the film, you have the moment where he simply goes out of the corridor. He's already tried to, you know, he's been sifting through Stalin's papers. He's opened up the safe. He's been sending it, you know, past the bodyguards, which is actually, again, a, an interesting note that the bodyguards of um, Beria hated him. Mm. And one of them, of course, was, you know, different. Uh, Semyonov comes off. And uh, again, interesting in name, Semyonov. Semyonovich was one of the men who testified against uh, Beria at his trial in December of 1953. Just again, a another little note. But the fact that the bodyguards, again, were more or less hostile to him and Beria was forced to try and force those details out of the window without attracting any attention to get to the NKV. <laughs> again, it's, a, it's another interesting note that, again, is if you take that context, of course, we don't know if any of this happened, it's poss possible, but again, it's just interesting. But of course, the reason why he's seen as so desperate is not because he's scared of Stalin in that particular moment, just because he's Stalin and he's, again, admonishes him. Rather, the film tries to make out that he's got his own lists, he's got his own plan or 
already. He's assuming that he's going to take control. And if Stalin recovers and knows that Beria has done this on his own volition, then Beria is almost certainly going to die. Yeah, so yeah. the implications in the film are far more severe than Khrushchev's account here of him simply cursing Stalin, of course. Yeah, yeah I mean, you don't see any of the cursing. There, There is the same where he sort of leans in close and whispers. What does he say? Like, have a good rest, old man. I'll take it from here or something. But, uh... Yeah, so that's, that's very much another obvious influence, which is leaning into this, is the Simon Seabag Montefiore biography of Stalin. And again, this is almost based on an account with Svetlana, where she mentions the idea of Beria taking the ring of lordship taking the king's ring away from him and assuming control for himself which is an interesting you know visual you know visual in terms of conceiving of how barrier thought of his position that he was effectively the anointed successor whether anyone knew it or not and that was very much the perception that other people had and of course khrushchev is in the background observing all of this happening um again reinforcing the idea that he will use anything he's got the daggers out and he's going to take control um so little elements like that which have an, you know an element of historical truth in it you know it, some of the sources may disagree with one another but there's a an aspect to it which all of these little details are interesting but nevertheless in this case he doesn't do this he goes out he smashes his arm on one of the pillars and then has to be told that uh Barry is dead but of course what happens in this account is actually more interesting it was simply impossible to listen to. It's also interesting that the moment Stalin regained consciousness and it seemed that he might recover, Barry threw himself on his knees beside him, grabbed his hand, and began to kiss it. When Stalin lost consciousness again and closed his eyes, Barry got back up on his feet and spat on the floor. That was the true mm. barrier. He was perfidious, even in his attitude towards Stalin, a man he supposedly worshipped and glorified. It came time for Bulganin and me to be on duty. We'd gone to Stalin's stature in the afternoon when the doctors had come, but we ourselves were on duty that night. I was more open and candid than Bulganin than I was with the others. We apparent, um, I said Nikolai Alexandrovich, we apparently now find ourselves in a situation in which Stalin is going to die. He is obviously not going to survive. Even the doctors say he won't. Do you know which post barrier has indicated he wants? Which he wants to take the post of the military and Ministry of State Security at that time? And again, we've talked about that. There's yeah. no way we can let this happen. If barrier takes control of state security, that will be the beginning of the end for us all. He wants to take that post so he can destroy all of us and he will do it. So very much this is the impression that we get across in the film that right from the beginning, Khrushchev does almost see this as a moment of life and death. And here in the picture, we see the plotting of Malenkov and Beria out in the field. Yeah. And of course, uh, we're not, we barely see any interaction between Bulganin and Khrushchev in the film, but Khrushchev goes off and he talks to Kaganovich and he talks, you know, he's relaying this idea that Barry is going to take power and Kaganovich is the doctrinaire <laughs> Stalinist. Tells, and then they all Nikki. and they all come running back when Svetlana right? comes, sorry. But, uh, but you know, he goes out and said, no, Nikki, we can't devolve into factualism. And then he points out very cogently that look at the faction over there that's forming, you know, <laughs> Albert and Costello over yeah. there. <laughs> and that's true. I mean, it's almost assumed that Malenkov is taken control by Beria at this time, but it's important to understand, as we've been trying, I've been trying to um, illustrate that Malenkov and Beria have been a political double act since at least 1946, when they were opposing Zhanov, who was the again supposed heir apparent before his mysterious death in 1948, which was one of the things that precipitated uh, the Doctor's plot. So. All of these things sort of are linking in, but um, you know, I, th I think we'll. Are there a couple of things you want to mention here? I suppose the devil's well, I, mean, I mean, the film doesn't sort of go into the whole um, question of Beria um, being involved in Stalin's death, but there were certainly sort of rumors that swirled. Khrushchev himself says that um, says in these memoirs that Beria said to him, "I took him out," referring to Stalin. So um, certainly, Khrushchev tried to sort of suggests that Beria was involved in maybe poisoning him or something like this. And well, this the more, something that the film really touches. Well, the, well, the more vocal proponent of that theory is actually Molotov, more so mm. than it is um, it's Khrushchev. And uh, Molotov, again, an ostensible ally, turns against him very quickly, as do all of the officials of the, of the um, Presidium Bureau. But that is an element which has still not gone away. I mean, there was a recent... Uh, the, the Soviet archives are being, you know, a lot of information has been coming out of them the last 20 years yeah, and yeah. a lot of evidence actually points to this idea that Stalin was hemorrhaging as to possibility again that he had in received some sort of wound or again he'd been poisoned yes this was um, a hemorrhage in the stomach right? yes a stomach hemorrhage 
uh, which again would possibly indicate poison. But others have indicated that this is perhaps again consistent with the the effects of. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I wouldn't know. These I mean, are... I would I would say, I mean, if it was just a stomach hemorrhage, he would have been able to speak when he regained consciousness, right? Because you know his brain's not been affected. But again, it's it's the possibility that he suffered a stroke and then Beria finished him off, so he wouldn't have any chance of recovery. Ah, yes, the pillow on the face. Yes, yes the pillow yeah. on the face. You know, we again, you're referencing I Claudius again. With <laughs> I love I Claudius so much. I can't with help it with Tiberius. But um, so there are elements as to what happened. Of course, the other rumor is that actually, no, the uh, Lukomsky actually did kill Stalin. I believe there's very little evidence to support that theory that his doctor killed him. However, there is a moment again because uh, even. Even um, Iannucci actually talks about this, where parts of the uh, sort of manuscript are actually toned down to make this more really um, to make this more um, real. After this, you have the embalmment scene, where um, the silly Stalin comes in and he starts shooting them and accusing them of stealing his <laughs> father's stealing brain his and brain trying to, to send it to America. <laughs> and send it to America, but no. But there's a this is based on the um, the graphic novel, and this is where the film actually really tones down its source material because in the graphic novel, Stalin dies because he's put on an American ventilator, but the American ventilator plug won't fit into the Soviet circuitry. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a little and there's a little reference to that because they have the American ventilator, which again gives the impetus for uh, Vasily to go on his uh, uh, wild rampage. And in the graphic novel, he actually kills people. He's not well. Just he opens doing... fire in the film as well, doesn't he? Yes, yeah, so he opens blasting. fire, but he, it doesn't actually kill anyone. So there are elements where they take the source material and turn it down. I wonder, but again, I th almost do think that that would have been too stupid about the Stalin dying because the plug socket was the wrong configuration. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I can... in, the, in the actual, um, you know, in what actually happened, I mean, Vasily did arrive, but he was really drunk and he had to be sort of shown out, right? So it, it was certainly quite quite chaotic and hectic, and Vasily was quite a, a rambunctious young man at the best mm -hmm. of times. So um, it must have been bedlam, I mean. But it's interesting, isn't it, that we're talking about a comedy film and we talked about all the various iterations that you can have Stalin dying and the film almost boldly in that situation chooses to go for the least um, exciting version of events, yeah, the most standard yeah. fair version of events in order to illustrate this. Um, so, yes, and uh, this section continues. I'm just wondering if there are any other elements within that scene that we, we've overlooked, but of course they're, they're all plotting. And then, of course, we have the, you know, the arrival of uh, Svetlana, but again, in terms of um, all of these little elements, which are from the source material and almost adapted correctly, there are a couple of images I just want to show. So let's get here. So of course, that is the image we have of the uh, the bureau of the presidium surrounding the death of the former general secretary. He's not actually the general secretary, as it's called in the film. He's going to be the the chairman of the council of yeah, ministers in order to be entirely pedantic. But with a nice with a nice puddle of piss. Nice puddle of piss. A, 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 he's a, a puddle of iniquity. Indignity, <laughs> sorry, indignity, yeah. uh, according to Khrushchev, not iniquity. Uh, but here on the right, that is the actual, uh, the, it's essentially called the Nera Dacha, the actual Stalin Dacha. And I was very impressed that the edifice, which they have in the film, is virtually identical in terms of the recreation of the Dacha. The only difference is that the color is slightly greener. But apart from that, it's a, it's a wonderful sort of recreation. I sort of want this moment to actually talk about the, uh, the interesting use of scenery, because we have a lot of sort of establishing shots. One is the, you know, the great sort of Seven Sisters, the, uh, the sort of Goliath era esque um, Stalin-esque architecture where you see these uh, uh, Art Deco skyscrapers, um, the seven dotted throughout the landscape of Moscow. Also, they've been built, um, for example, in the city of Warsaw as well. Mm. And uh, Stalin's great plans for a, a monolithic temple dedicated to Lenin, which was going to dwarf all of this in terms <laughs> of this uh, megalomaniacal architecture. But just, again, little things like the dedication to the design of the Dacha and even the interiors. I mean, the interior design of all the set pieces in this film, they're all evoking this you know, 1930s, 1940s, um, 40s sort of uh, Art Deco style. But it's, you know, it's stark. It's, um, it's, it's functional. And it's rather imposing, yet at the same time, it doesn't seem farcical or unbelievable. You can imagine that they're using these settings. And of course, looking at the production, all of these are just uh, settings of various um, landmarks in London. Virtually all of the interior sets were done in London. Um, mm. Some of the exterior sets were done in 
Ukraine in Kiev, uh, but virtually nothing was actually filmed in Russia. So I, I find well, that well for, for for obvious reasons, for right? obvious reasons. But no, I, I just thought um, it, even in terms of just all the aspects of the film you can enjoy. We talked about the Shostakovich-esque yeah. uh, score. We talked about the employment of music and how that actually, if you look at the background, configures into the wider plot and, and the plot and the uh, the gathering storm and the potential succession crisis. Yeah, there are, talking there about a couple the interior of, design. There are a couple of sort of repeated visual motifs you see. I mean, another one is the big sort of huge um, um, motorways, you know, the big highways, and you have a car, sort of lone car coming along. That's something that they use again and again in the film as well. I'm not sure exactly why, but um, I do like it. it. It does add to that sort of um, claustrophobic sensation, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, that is an image I've actually seen quite a lot of in terms of biopics mm. of Stalin representing the drive between the Dacha and the drive between the Kremlin across that bridge in particular. I forget the name of the bridge, um, but again, that is, again, supposedly the correct passage. Into, I've never been to Moscow, unfortunately, which links the, the Kremlin with Stalin's Dacha. Um, but again, an another little element, as soon as uh, this is going back to Khrushchev's account, as soon as Stalin died, Beria immediately got into his car and rushed off to Moscow for the nearby Dacha. We decided to call all members of the Bureau, or it may in fact have been all members of the Presidium, I don't remember exactly. And again, while we were waiting for them to, uh, to come, Malenkov kept walking back and forth in the room, obviously upset. I decided to have a word with him. And again, uh, just elements like that, like them chasing away to rush off to the Kremlin and Beria being the one to do it first <laughs> again it's taken verbatim and it's again it's a use as another joke the fact that they're the ones trying to get out of the uh the dacha first in order to assume power effectively yeah and um, I, mean, I mean it's interesting because you know Beria does have this sort of um you know he's portrayed in the film as you know immediately after stalin dies you just sort of um you know goes goes into his plan immediately starts calling you know as if he's got this got this whole arranged but um, I mean, it, you know, it, after Stalin's actual death, did not um, Beria he did like, cordon off Moscow with his own men, right? That part is true, at least. Yes, uh, what he quickly did was assume control. I mean, the fear came true was that he assumed control of the state security agencies. That is true, and he used them to cordon off Moscow and take areas of control. But this area in the film. I think this is actually possibly the weakest scene in the film in, in its entirety because it's something I'm not ever sure what the message is trying to be conveyed, which is after you have this comical scene where the limousines are trying to get out first to rush towards the Kremlin, you have the roundup out of all the evidence and you have various gunshots going off in the Dacha. You have all the staff being rounded out by officers of the NKVD and Stalin's bodyguard units. And it's obvious that the bodyguard units and the NKVD agents are adversarial, so they're shooting each other. Other. And the last thing you see is all the doctors are packed off into the truck along with the maid, as you see um, Beria's henchmen shooting one of the members of Stalin, uh, Stalin's bodyguard troop. And I wonder again as to what the you know, whether this is just to betray how life was valued so little in the Soviet Union up until that point, or how all of this was just again almost farcical to the point of how they dealt with all these things, getting rid of all the evidence. But I, I've never sort of I mean, there's a moment where. Um, Petrovna says, you know, I don't understand what's happening. And that's kind of the impression yeah. I get from that scene. I mean, there are little funny moments where you see the 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 uh, the doubles of Stalin being shuffled out and put into a van. <laughs> uh, but all in all, I think you could have cut a lot of elements of that scene and the film wouldn't have lost anything. I mean, I think I think it's also, I don't know, maybe maybe they want a little bit of action, you know, um, something like that. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, uh, it's something that never sort of um, felt right to me in terms of exactly what they were trying to convey, because you've already got that impression of everyone's life as, again, on the line with that first scene where you have the concert and you have all the NKVD units rounding up all of those yeah. people at night involving. So I think you've already had that. It sort of it seems a bit redundant to do it again, especially when you have a lot of politicking around who controls the. Well, I don't think. I don't think I don't think subtlety is the strong suit of many people, <laughs> you know. Um, Stalin... I'll also say I'll also say another scene that I loved. Um, talking about the doctors is when they come to they come to pick up the old doctor and he just try, he tries to run away. Run away. It always always makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he uh, he tries to run away, and you have the. Uh... 
the, the, the again the the official who is responsible for the the evidence in the first doctor's plot you know rounding them all up and then you have them having collective responsibility as well in terms of pronouncing a medical verdict as well yeah and it's just painful they're like we unanimously believe you know? it, yes stalin is dead what are we going to do now why talk about that now everyone's coming and we'll talk about it then that's what they're gathering for. He seemed to be talking about a democratic position in this reply, but I understood it differently. The way I understood it, he was talking about control over all questions with Beria come to agreement long ago. All right, I said, we'll talk about it later. Everyone gathered, they saw that Stalin was dead. Svetlana also arrived, I greeted her. When I greeted her, I felt a very strong rush of emotion and began to cry. I couldn't hold it back. I sincerely felt sorry for her. Stalin and his children, I mourned his death with all my heart, and I was greatly troubled for the future of our party and our country. And again, you can't help but feel that uh, Khrushchev is laying it on a little bit uh, thick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I felt that Beria would now take over, and that would be the beginning of the end of us all. I didn't trust him and didn't consider him a real communist. I considered him capable of anything, a butcher and a murderer, who would make short work of those he didn't like. And um, this is, again, very sort of interestingly sort of emphasized in the film because the, the political utility of Svetlana is not made completely obvious, but it's something which one has to allude to. And I bring up Zhivanov again because she was married off, I think, three times for political purposes and once for love or maybe twice. I can't quite remember, but she was married four times in total. And one of the marriages the second marriages was to yuri janov the son of andre janov so she, again oh interesting in terms of possible uh consolidation actually marrying into the stalin family and positioning uh janov as the potential heir but of course this all coincided with his death so it all amounted to nothing so there is definitely a political utility with being associated with shretlana and I think, again, having her support, it could be seen as some form of continuity, because I'm sorry, but for all intents and purposes, when you establish such autocratic control, no matter how many supposed democratic mechanisms or communist principles you evoke, um, appealing to the, the children of the dead king, I think is quite an expedient uh, political yeah, move indeed. in this case. And of course, Svetlana was naturally the person to appeal to because Vasily was such a, a, a liability. <laughs> yeah i mean another thing that i was quite i was quite amazed to read about is the whole thing i mean i, I think it happened earlier um significantly earlier but the whole thing about um um Vasily and the hockey team and the plane crash that oh yes happened. we haven't mentioned that yes um, <laughs> the only the only thing i think you can um get at the film for is that that happened three years before stalin's death but no it actually happened i mean he was promoted around and they tried to find a job for him which he wouldn't screw anything up anything that he wouldn't cock up yeah um and he gravitated towards the air force and he gravitated towards the russian national hockey team and he was responsible for them for about three years and then there was a fluke snowstorm in 1950 that killed off most of the team and so you have him at the end desperately trying to get these <laughs> I, I don't know people they just rounded off the streets to try and play ice hockey um i don't know what's trying to get off but again then you know his uh, his famous phrase you know uh stalin doesn't f up you know stalin's son doesn't f up yeah. and uh lovely little elements like that um you know again they they lean more into the psychology of uh vasily stalin in the source material but again i don't think he's too crucial at all to understand what goes on i mean a lot of the elements historically are there but they're toned down considerably and i think also in the interest that we're talking about a time span which takes place over an entire year whereas in the film it, it takes place over let's let's be you know real seven days yeah. from about the from about the you know the first of march until the eighth and the ninth of march where we have the the funeral of stalin where ostensibly the anti barrier coup takes place rather than in june but anyway what, what actually back, um what actually happened to vasily in the end because i know that i know that um svetlana defected to the u.s right yes in 1967 uh yes which which must have been which must have been incredible by the way yes it was it was quite it was quite sensational i, I think I'll, I'll bring up all the svetlana bits here because I, I was planning on bringing up the bit later we might as well talk about it here um obviously when beria comes back one of the first things he does is release Paulina, the wife of Molotov, to basically use her as some sort of political tool to try and emotionally bring Molotov over to supporting his camp. Um, that's one of the first things he does. But of course, what does this do for Svetlana? This precipit uh, precipitates her asking, can you do the same for me? 
and she brings up um, Alexei Kepler. And this is very interesting because, you know, Svetlana obviously was used as a political prop for Stalin. And, you know, Svetlana herself was not in the best of mental health, considering what happened to her mother, Nadia, who committed suicide in 1932. So the Stalin children grew up without a father. I mean, in, in terms of giving a, a bit of fair dues to Vasily, Vasily once tried to commit suicide and Stalin responded saying, you can't even hit yourself properly. You can't even target yourself properly. In terms of the, again, the pure evil of this man and how little he cared for his son. But I think, again, he cared for Svetlana in the way that she was some sort of surrogate for his wife. I don't mean that in the, in the you know, sexual sense, but I mean that in a, you know, he's not a barrier. Um, yeah. So there are elements of that which it carries over. But talking about this particular aspect with him and um, her and um, Alexei Kepler, Alexei Kepler was a 38 year old, if I remember correctly, Jewish filmmaker, and she was a 16 year old girl and she fell in love with him. And Stalin believed that this was completely objectionable. She couldn't fall in love with a man who was more than twice her age. And of course, he was a bit of an anti-Semite as well. So he was, over the next sort of 10 years, progressively sent to various camps. He wasn't sent to Kolyma, which was mentioned in the film. Um, and of course, she begs begs um, Beria to try and release him to again do a Paulina for her. And uh, he's wrongly stated as having been killed when trying to escape Kalima. I think, again, they mentioned Kalima because it's the one that people know. If you're talking about the gulags, it was the worst gulag. It was in the extreme east of Russia. It was a gold mine. And it's where a lot of the literature coming out in the place, again, makes sense. But again, I think in terms of what the film was trying to get across, it was trying to show her own desperation, her isolation, essentially what almost pity what Khrushchev was trying to get across in this account. But historically, she wasn't that isolated, because as I mentioned, she was isol you know, she was remarried you know, four times throughout her life. Yeah. And um, Kepler and, was and released think, um... and he and he survived. Kepler was released and he survived and they didn't have this uh, new relationship afterwards. So I, I think for the sake of the film, they mentioned one character who was gulagged as a result of his affection for you know, inappropriate love for Svetlana. And they had to use that moment to form some sort of emotional divide between Beria and Svetlana. So he wouldn't essentially be able to control her, which he was you know, trying very much oh, to do. Okay, I see. Does that make sense? So that, that's my reading of it. No, I like that. I like that. It, it is interesting, though, to, to hear about all of these sort of um, um, political marriages and political connections, because, um, I mean, in the film, she's she's made out to be I mean, how old? How old was she? Was she when Stalin died? Uh, she would have been about thirty, I think. Thirty. Uh, whereas mm. in the film, she comes across as you know a bit younger, quite sort emotionally of silly. stunted. Yes. Yeah, it's like silly and naive. Yeah. Um, and I do, think, do, you think, do you think that's sort of like an accurate um, portrayal of her as a as 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 a person? You know, I mean, you know, or was she a bit more savvy in the real world? A bit more. Well, she was you know, a lecturer. She wasn't a she didn't have the sort of mindset of a child. She was yeah. a writer and she was a lecturer. So I think what they were they were almost in trying to intentionally infantilize her to prove the point, which is how again Stalin you can imagine being the child of Joseph Stalin. I mean <laughs> they're portraying the silly on one hand and they're trying to portray the Svetlana as almost the other side of the coin for, you know, childhood neglect, emotional withdrawal and all that sort of thing and her constantly dithering on and talking about all these childhood memories almost completely oblivious of all the political implications ramifications going on and you know almost you know trying to remind Vasily I think there's one moment where she says Vasily you know uh you know, the world is full of wolves you know things like that and you know to to keep safe and things like that her having this you know again motherly affection for Vasily again trying to compensate for Nadia there's a lot going on but I wonder as to what extent that is actually true um mm. because again when looking at Svetlana's accounts Svetlana actually does seem to be a rather dispassionate and objective observer of the events going on and she's quite a reliable source and I don't think that comes across at all in the in the film i think again she's intentionally infantilized in order to get that image across about the idea of being the child of stalin um so again as of all of these things they oversimplify and caricature the characters to fit in with their comedy essentially um as to whether that makes the film better or not i don't know as to your question 
what happened to Vasily Stalin. There is a moment in the film where, of course, we've had his moment where he goes and tries to shoot and accuses uh, the doctors of giving over his brain to the Americans because they have that little moment where they mention the American ventilator, which is a reference to the comic. Um, later, you have the funeral scene. And again, I, I just love the, the moment where they choose to set the pre-funeral with, with the bodies in state and in the real history it would have been in the House of Columns in Moscow. And they choose to set it to the final movement of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, which is one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever written. But after that, you have this moment where there's this, again, this connection between Beria and Svetlana, which is asking for Kepler to come back. And that's broken when you have Vasily going into one of the palace rooms adjoining the body and state. And he tries to claim that the, you know, the Politburo track. I can't remember exactly what he says, but I think he's repeating what he said earlier about his brain being sent over to America. And he's doing it to a bunch of Chinese officials. I was very pleased actually to note in the credits, not mentioned in the film, but in the credit, one of those officials is named as Zhao Enlai. Stalin, of course, didn't attend oh. the funeral, but Zhao Enlai, who was the prime minister of the so uh, the prime minister of the People's Republic of China, did. So little details like that. They could have just named you know, nameless Chinese officials, but they bothered to give him a name and little things like that. Um, again, to credit to the film, even though they could have perhaps have mentioned who these people were. I think it's well, pretty I'm obvious. I'm pretty, I I'm pretty sure the Chinese even declared like a week of mourning for Stalin. Yes, I, I mean, they had to because... This is before the Sino-Soviet split. So already ostensibly, Stalin is the communist monolith. He is essentially the yeah. elder brother of all communist nations. And the and Chinese are still certainly the junior partner. At this this point, is only four yeah. years after the conclusion of the Civil War. And this is during mm. the Korean War, in which the Soviets and the Chinese were very much on the same side. So again, you can go into that room and you can say they're probably North Koreans, probably uh, communist Chinese. It doesn't really matter. Well, he goes in, he makes a fool of himself. Zhukov comes in and he beats him senseless and says, you know, for, for defaming the uniform. And to summarize very quickly, you know, if you ignore all the stuff that happens later with Vasily, where he is taken out and he does that stupid speech on the balcony. Oh, um, Russian comes, Lithuanian comes. Uh, because again, oh. this, this happened months after the funeral. Um, there was a moment where he did apparently accost a group of foreign attendees and make all these ridiculous claims. And the results of that were severe. It wasn't that they were trying to bury him or trying to you know, prevent him making you know, some sort of major uh, political faux pas. They ostracized him from the army, uh, Khrushchev and Malenkov. Um, they removed all of his uh, political functions. They even forbid him to use the name Stalin. They forced him to revert back to the name of Shukashvili, which was Stalin's original name. Of course, mm. Stalin was a, nom, uh, was a uh, nom de guerre like his previous name, Kolba. Um, so all of these things were stripped from him, and he spent the rest of his life um, in prison, prevaricated between prison and sanatorium, and he died a wreck and an alcoholic, I think, at the age of 40. So a very miserable life for mm. Vasily Stalin. There was also the implication that uh, he had insisted before uh, all of this happened on taking up uh, the military control of the district of Moscow. Which <laughs> you gotta admire the the balls. <laughs> so that that element is you know covered a bit in the film that uh, you can sort of infer that somewhat with uh, what happens with um, uh, Zhukov beating uh, beating him, but nevertheless it doesn't sort of carry through in terms of what happens after. No. They try and summarize it by saying you know we're going to keep an eye on him because he can't go around spreading these conspiracy theories. Um, after the you know uh, the, the trial of Beria at the end of the film, and they also Khrushchev says to Svetlana to go over to Vienna, which she never does. Of course, she stays in the Soviet Union and then she defects to the Americans. I wonder again what they were trying to get across there, but um, that's sort of the history as opposed to how it's conveyed in the film. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's because they want to keep up that idea of her being, as you said, this kind of infantilized girl, as opposed to a woman who was maybe a bit stronger, a bit more savvy, a bit more independent than that, and could still be here, could still hold her own, if you know what I mean. You know what I'm well, they, they almost do the same with Paulina. I mean, um, with Paulina, she is a effective politician in her own right, but as they almost make her a more extreme iteration of Molotov, 
in the fact that when we have that scene where Beria goes to her in her prison cell and he explains to her, you know, Stalin's dead, I want to let you go home. And then she cries saying, Stalin, ask mm. Stalin, um, all these little elements. And I think, again, they took her character and they're trying to use her as a form of microcosm for expressing, you can almost say this state of collective Stockholm syndrome yeah. that everyone in the Soviet Union and the occupied countries felt when they it's genuinely... Hor it's, it's horrifying. You come across it a lot. You know, I mean, when you read Solzhenitsyn, you know, it's and it's always the people who are you know, more supportive of the party, you know, you'll have some, you know, min minor official in some town and he gets sent to the gulag and they just keep saying to themselves, you know, again and again, you come across people like this, oh, well, there must have been some mistake, you know, sh they have me confused with someone else, you know, oh, I'll be out of here in a couple months or I'll be out of here soon, you know, once they realize what they've done. Um, it's very dark. It's very dark. And as you say, it's a kind of sort of Stockholm syndrome. Yes, well, we'll get back to that a bit later when the film covers the uh, the death of the protesters. Uh, there's just a, a couple of little things I want to um, I want to say, which is have I got my image here? Here we are. Oh, I saw the funeral <laughs> there. The funeral's good fun. So we have okay. So we've we've gone away from the dacha now. We're talking about the new the new world order which has been set up in the comic. There's this reference to Beria creating this glorious future. But we're going on to the figure of Malenkov because Malenkov is now de facto the leader of the Soviet Union. Uh, for all intents and purposes, even though he's not general secretary, because that position has now been abolished, he's uh, would be chairman of the Council of Ministers. He's doing that role unofficially now, and I, I love the fact that they start him off that he's played by Jeffrey Tambor. For, again, interestingly enough, to have a hangover actor come over and uh, play the role here, <laughs> um, and, and again from the from the the writers and uh, director of Alan Partridge. We come here and uh, he is obsessed with image. You know, he's portrayed as wearing a corset, as wearing makeup. I think there's a reference to, did you get your hair embalmed or something ridiculous <laughs> or something ridiculous like that. You know, he is obsessed with the idea of being the nominal head, the representative of the Soviet Union with constant references to I'm doing it for the people, et cetera, et cetera. And this carries over into the funeral scene. And I love the moment where um, the funeral director is organizing, you know, what portrait will be more effective for the secretary and of course <laughs> yeah. you know cheekbones not cheekbones and this is the picture that uh Malenkov ordered to be destroyed on the, on the right and <laughs> but, but but again just the the care to detail i mean it's not obviously jeffrey tambo doesn't actually look a lot like um uh doesn't look a lot like Malenkov, but nevertheless there was a there was an attempt here to make it equivocate with the official portrait that you see with Malenkov and uh I don't know. The, yeah. the, I mean, again, sort of... again, it's this sort of um, very focused caricature. And the key thing I think they were trying to get at is that this is a man who, and, you know, you might, you might disagree, you know, far more about this than I, but, um, you know, this idea that he was content to sort of remain the premier, even though he didn't have, you know, the kind of hard power that his predecessor had. He had the sort of the image of power, um, the figurehead. And that's what they try and get across in the film. And I think that's some people have opinions of Malenkov in that way. But how do you think that sort of squares up with reality? You know? Well, as um, I, we're going to get into with Khrushchev's own interpretation of Malenkov, my interpretation of Malenkov is that Malenkov was an actor, an, an intelligent actor who was able to maneuver himself into that position on his own initiative. And he used Beria as a useful tool to get into that position. I mean, it should be noted again, comparing this to the figure who isn't in the film, but I keep referencing Andrei Zhanov. He was his, he was the head of his own political bloc against Andrei Zhanov before the death of Stalin. The Soviet Union effectively, when it came to culture and when it came to the sciences, because we're talking about the creation of the Soviet atom bomb, there was a huge amount of pressure on the Soviet political system to create an atom bomb because from 1945 until 1949, the Soviet Union had a, you can say, fatal disadvantage compared to the United States of America. Yeah, you're at their mercy, really. At you? their mercy. And so, again, the possibility of, a, of the war, the, the, the Second World War continuing into Russia, something advocated by... Um, uh, Patton, uh Mac and MacArthur and Patton, yeah, <laughs> all the chads. <laughs> so, but again, so there's a serious threat. So, we're talking about do we support the scientific community? Do we support these so called technocrats 
or do we support the party ideologues? And what Malenkov did during this time was position himself as the leader of the pragmatic group, i.e. the group who was supporting uh, scientific independence against political ideology, against you know, Lysenkoism and against Zhanov. So he's able to form various political blocks and he's able to, again, eliminate his political targets. You know, Malenkov was one of the key figures in removing Zhanov as a, you know, a possible contender. And again, you can wonder as to whether Zhanov was you know, genuinely ill or whether he was murdered. That's never really going to be proven. So I do believe that he was an effective power broker. And what we see in the film is a caricature. And I love the portrayal, Jeffrey Tambor's portrayal of Malenkov in the film. It's wonderful and it makes me laugh every single time. Mm -hmm. But as with all these things we keep mentioning, it's, uh, I mean, just look at here. I mean, as we see in these you know, wonderful images of the actual funeral and how they correlate, the one exception is Malenkov wearing white. He's referred to as the Snow King. Um, and again, this is this is, <laughs> this is something which equivocates with the idea for some reason the General Secretary Stalin has to wear white. And this is actually a moment where the film tones down the ridiculousness, because this is how, when he's usually worn white, he usually wears this hat, which I'll find here, and this image. <laughs> so we have, so we have Mikhayan, we have Khrushchev, we have Stalin, we have Malenkov, we have Beria, and we have Molotov. Look at Beria in the middle, sorry, um, Malenkov in the middle. Uh, uh, Columba and I were talking about this before we went on. Uh, he looks like some sort of combination of the Michelin Man and Donald Duck. <laughs> yeah, he looks like the, um, the sort of the marshmallow monster from Ghostbusters. <laughs> I mean, Starling can carry it off, but not so much. Yeah. <laughs> and that ridiculous hat. So if anything, he and the, the histori- round, and the round little face as well. <laughs> it's just so good. So if anything, the historical character looked more ridiculous than the uh, the Snow King, as as portrayed in the um, as portrayed in the film. No, I, I absolutely love it. And um, in terms of, again, the, so we go from this, and this is the moment where Beria really begins to control uh, Malenkov. Mal- you know, he suggests to Malenkov that I'm going to find the, the girl who was with Stalin in order to portray some sort of, uh, I don't know, picture continuity <laughs> between the, uh, the great and leader then, and, and Stalin's when, humanity going forward. <laughs> and when they finally appear on the balcony, you can just see like the very tip of the girl's head. Yes. <laughs> and him waving to the Soviet people. I know it's, it's completely ridiculous, but it's during this moment that Malenkov, you know, wanders, almost asking permission of Beria. Do you think we can, you know, tone down the death lists, you know, the the doctor's purge, etc. And then Beria almost as a form of, you know, a religious counselor in terms of the the Soviet, uh, the Soviet religion says, oh, it's perfectly possible. We can go even further than that. And um, and again, Beria is portrayed as a consummate postmodernist here. He's able to constantly warp the truth and change things to fit whatever political goal is going on at the moment, which lends credence to the idea of Khrushchev that he was just a consummate politician rather than you know any sort of uh, adherent of any sort of version of communism. And Malenkov is drawn along with this, and this is where we get to. Um, Khrushchev's account of the of the cabinet scene, uh, which is interestingly held in a Hammersmith town hall, and it's, it's a very sort of evocative image. It's very cold and sterile, but also sort of very imposing and authoritative. I like the choice of venue for the uh, the presidium meeting, and this is where Khrushchev talks about the distribution of portfolios. And here, Beria proposes that Malenkov be appointed chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Soviet Union and be relieved of his duties as secretary of the Central Committee. So, uh, essentially, this is almost verbatim what we see in the film he's elevated to the role of chairman of the council of ministers even though interesting enough they don't actually use this to refer to stalin but it's used here i think there's a bit of discrepancy but they're actually using the effective historical titles here in this meeting maybe again because they have access to the minutes of it Malenkov proposed that Beria be confirmed as his first deputy and the two ministries, state security and internal affairs, be merged into one, Beria heading up the new industry, the new ministry. And again, this isn't so much mentioned before, you know, in the film, it's portrayed that Beria already has control over the two ministries, state security and internal affairs as the NKVD. Of course, the NKVD no longer exists, but this combination of the MGB and the MVD and also him assuming the position of deputy prime minister at the same time is significant and it's commented on the film and you know very much opposed by Khrushchev who believes this is you know nothing more than a, a you know a relentless power grab on the part of Beria. That's quite, a, quite an insatiable man. I held my tongue, Bulganin did too. I was concerned that Bulganin might make a move prematurely. 
It would have been wrong to give ourselves away in advance. I saw that the mood of the others was. If Bolganin and I had said we were opposed, the majority, the majority of those present would have accused us of being disruptors, trying to disorganize things, trying to start a fight at the party of posts when Stalin's corpse had not yet grown cold. Everything was moving in the direction I had feared. Bolotov was also appointed as first deputy to Malenkov. Gaganovich was simply made a deputy. It was proposed that Voroshilov be elected chairman of the Presidium of the Soviet Se of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. Um, and uh, again, Shenik is not a character who appears as with Voroshilov. Beria expressed himself very disrespectfully about Shenik. He said that in general, no one in the country knew who he was. And of course, the film doesn't <laughs> differ with that idea at all. Mm. Um, he wanted to make Voroshilov the man who would sign the orders when Beria would start his meat, uh, meat grinder working. Beria proposed that I be relieved of my duties as secretary of the Moscow committee so that I could concentrate on the work in the central committee. We made other appointments, arrangements for the funeral were adopted and arrangements for notifying the people about Stalin's death. This was how we, the heirs of Stalin, began the work of governing the country and leading the party on our own. Now, in terms of that, in the film, Khrushchev is given specific responsibility to organize the funeral. And I so wonder... There, so that's sort of, there's a kernel of truth there in the sense that they're trying to sort of... Because um, um, didn't you say there in the actual um, account that Khrushchev gave, Khrushchev gave that they were trying to relieve him of certain responsibilities? Yes. So there's an element where they were trying to relieve him of certain responsibilities as, you know, secretary of the Moscow Committee of the Party. So he's no longer Moscow party boss. So he's losing that authority. But what happens you know, very soon after is that Malenkov actually, again, relinquishes one of his positions as head of the party, as well as head of the Council of Ministers. And that position is actually given to um, given back to Khrushchev very quickly within a couple of weeks. Mm. I believe this is on the 5th of March and the next one's on the 15th of March. So what seems as though, you know, Khrushchev has been demoted, he very much quickly makes up the position and becomes more powerful. And the principle here is that there is this general onus, which is again emphasized very correctly um, in the film, which is this desire not to go back to one man rule, this desire to rule as a collective, this desire to rule as a committee. And the onus, the official onus from Malenkov giving Khrushchev this power is the idea that if he were to hold control over the ministries and over the party at the same time, that he would be seen to be a domineering figure that could lead to his own downfall. So he would rather hold, again, in terms of this image of him as holding the official headship of the Soviet Union, he would rather hold less positions to keep that position rather than dominate all power by himself, unlike what happens with Beria. So again, I said, but again, he's doing this, he's doing this proactively. He's not doing this to, you know, to just on the orders of Beria. He has his own volition. I yeah. think he's aware of his own limitations. So again, unlike the character, a character we have in the film, yes, this is a weak man. Uh, this is a man who is very much aware of his own limitations, but he has a political savviness which is completely absent yeah. in the film. To say, I mean, that, didn't uh, he? I mean, he, li he lived to a pretty ripe old age, didn't he, Malenkov? So he couldn't have been that stupid. Uh, well, I mean, interestingly enough, uh, there's a wonderful story, actually, I was going to bring up at the end as to what happened to them, but you have the anti-party plot where Molotov and uh, Malenkov and Kaganovich try and take over power from Khrushchev in 1957, shortly followed after by the fall of Zhukov. And rather than killing them, you have this, uh, I would say it's wonderful in terms of the humiliation. Molotov is sent to be the ambassador to Mongolia rather than being killed off. Oh, it's a fun job, huh? <laughs> and um, I, I believe Malenkov was sent off to be the head of a uh, uh, hydroelectric works in Ukraine. <laughs> so, this, is, this is what I mean by humiliating position. And uh, I think Kaganovich was sent over to oversee a mining operation in the Urals. Oh, I love that. Good. Rot. <laughs> So um, a lot of sort of interesting things to sort of indicate here. Um, and this is where we have what Khrushchev really thinks about um, these characters. As I recall those days, and again, he's talking from the June of 1st, 1971, I'm obliged to state honestly that what we inherited after Stalin's death was painful and difficult. Our country was in disarray. His leadership, which had taken shape under Stalin, was not a good one, if I may put it that way. An ill-sorted group of people have been lumped together. 
there was Molotov, who was incapable of any innovation. And again, that's very much the impression that we get from the film, with Molotov very much wanting to appear faithful to Stalin and his legacy. There is a little moment of rebellion where we have this roundabout logic where he says, no, in order to be true Stalinists, we need to um, forge our own path as part of a new collective leadership. <laughs> um, maybe that's you know the, the only sort of aspect, spark of innovation, but it's very much done, again, as this idea of a doctrinaire, constitutionally adherent yeah. um, Stalinist. Um, I, I will be innovative insofar as Stalin would permit me to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Beria, who was dangerous for everyone. There was Malenkov, who was a real tumbleweed, a rolling stone, an unreliable element. And there was Kaganovich, a man who was always blindly carried out Stalin's will. Ten million people were in prison camps. The prisons were overflowing. There was even a special prison for party activists, which Malenkov had established as a result of a special order from Stalin. And again, this is another point to note. Malenkov was actively involved in the purges in the 1930s. He wasn't an official that shied away from all of this, if anything. The one figure out of all of these who actually shied away from the purges the most was probably Molotov. When looking, you know, Mer Beria was actively involved in purging the NKVD of all the elements which Stalin had disposed of after the excesses of the purges, whereas Malenkov was again intimately involved in all of this as well. So to say that any of these figures were as cartoonish <laughs> as what we get in the um, the film is, you know, to to undermine that. Certainly, these were all, you know, in some cases monsters. Right. In the international situation, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. The Cold War was in full swing. The burden on the Soviet people from the priority given to the war production was unbelievable. During Stalin's funeral and afterward, Beria was always very attentive toward me, making a great display of respect. I was surprised at this. He certainly didn't break off his friendly relations with Malenkov in some demonstrative way, but he suddenly began to establish friendly relations with me as well. If the two of them were getting ready to take a walk around the Kremlin, they would invite me too. In short, they began making a public display of how close I was to them. Of course, I didn't object. Although my negative opinion of Beria hadn't changed, on the contrary, it had, made, it had grown even stronger. An agreement had been made that the agenda for the Presidium meetings would be drawn up by two people, Malenkov and Khrushchev. Malenkov chaired the meetings, and I merely took part in drawing up the agenda. As for Beria, he kept accumulating more and more power, and his arrogance grew swiftly. All the cleverness of mind that the provocateur was capable of was put into action. The first clash between Beria and Malenkov on the one hand and the other members of the Presidium on the other took place around this time. The composition of the Presidium had changed. We had all restored the former small, uh, the, we had restored the former small members. And again, this is something which needs to be mentioned. They talk about the elimination of members, how there were 25 members, the 19, um, 19th Politburo. These were all purged almost immediately. And the characters that you see in the film are effectively what is left of the real presidium of the Soviet Union. And I think that's fair. And again, I think... Yeah, they're keeping it simple, as we've said. They're, they're simplifying it and to increase and then remove all of these characters. I think, again, it would have complicated the story. Yeah, ne so needlessly complicated it, yeah. Mm. Beria and Malenkov presented a proposal to cancel a decision made under Stalinism to build socialism in the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. And this is something I really want to get into in terms of what isn't and what isn't really referenced in the film. I think I'll quickly go over the funeral because Khrushchev has gone over it here. Of course, the funeral isn't some sort of grand impetus to you know, eliminate barrier. This doesn't happen over the course of several days. This happens over the course of the better part of a year. Nevertheless, I can't help but feel, again, the attention to detail and the comparison of the images that you see here. Um, and that wonderful scene where they're jockeying around the coffin. Uh, Khrushchev is trying to <laughs> yeah, change they try, position. They try and make it look like it's part of the ceremony. Yeah, that's great. So trying funny. to change by the ceremony and um again little elements like barrier trying to reconcile the bishops which again is true he tried to bring elements of religion back in and that was of course viscerally opposed by molotov and all the doctrinaire communists at the same time so all of these again fragmentary elements were true however what isn't true is the fact that all of these people outside who were genuinely coming to moscow to mourn stalin were being shot uh by again, erroneously NKVD officials. But before I get into that, I just want to mention the introduction to George Zhukov, uh, which is the moment you particularly love, Columbo, when he comes in and he shrugs oh, off his cape fantastic. and yeah. shakes his medals. 
again, just in terms of um, uh, attention to detail, of course, you mentioned the rather pedantic criticism by Richard Overy that he was Marshal Zhukov rather than Field Marshal Zhukov. I mean, do you really want to get into a conversation about how the Soviets you know, disbanded the officer corps? They couldn't even name name troops officers. They only named them commanders who have com car and div com <laughs> and things like this. <laughs> now, I don't really want to get into a conversation about that. And again, an elongated, pointless conversation about Soviet nomenclature. But just again, in terms of the details, I know I'm focusing on potentially trivial things, but, uh, you know, such as the imagery. Um, there's one thing I want to differentiate about Jason Isaacs is that to my mind he looks very similar to Rokossovsky who was the another marshal of the Soviet Union a marshal of Poland one of the key Stalinist figures in Poland during the immediate uh, post-war period um, and uh, I don't know just a little bit of dye in your hair to gray it a bit <laughs> would make yeah. Jason Isaacs look a, li a lot and again maybe cut your hair um, make you make you look more balding will make you look a lot more like Zhukov but for some reason he looks a lot more like Rokossovsky nevertheless looking at the medals I know it looks like you know a ridiculous little thing to pay such close attention to them but as you can see in the left image which is of Georgi Zhukov and the right images of Rokossovsky he has three little stars on his top right and those are the highest honors in the Soviet Union the hero of the Soviet Union only two men I believe have been awarded the hero of the Soviet Union four times one was Zhukov one was Brezhnev who kept awarding himself <laughs> at every at every at every uh, major um, birthday despite the fact he barely had any military record even to note mm -hmm. <laughs> again again an element of Brett Leonard British of uh, narcissism but even little notes that he wasn't awarded the fourth hero of the uh, hero of the Soviet Union until after this period so it was three correct things like that little uh, moments of tension but there are moments which are again overly simplified the fact that he is talked of as head of the Soviet army. The idea that there would be any autonomous head of the Soviet army that wasn't politically neutered is absurd, I have to say it yeah. in this time. It's very much oversimplified in the fact that he has the Red Army. He has the Red Army at this point in the sense that he has personal prestige. But after the war, Stalin, again, like we saw with Trotsky, was obsessed with Bonapartism. He believed that a, empowering a successful general would lead to his own downfall because he now, you know, Zhukov, potentially had a political constituency that could eviscerate Stalin. So what did he do after the war? Did he promote Zhukov after, you know, being the leader of the effective Soviet war effort from 1941 onwards? No. He took him as you know, the supreme commander in Germany, the supreme commander of the Soviet forces on the Western Front, and moved him to Odessa, hundreds of miles away from the front lines against yeah. the, um, the former off, Allied forces. Yeah. And then I think he moved him even further away to the Urals. And uh, Zhukov referred to this as being moved from a second-rate command to a fifth-rate command. <laughs> so Zhukov was repositioned as essentially the most high-ranking figure in the Soviet army, the chief of staff of, 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 of the chief of staff of the Soviet army, which even today of the Russian armed forces is the highest ranking office. Um, he briefly held that rank in 1941 to make him the technically the highest ranking officer, as much as that word was tolerated in the Soviet Union. Um, but that position was not held by Zhukov at that time. As I mentioned, the Minister of Defense um, would become Bulganin. So right after Stalin's death, Bulganin would be the one to hold uh, that sort of uh, monstrous position of power. But because I, again, I, I look this sort of thing up, the actual um, figure who should have been the, oh, I forgot his name now. <laughs> I love it, setting myself up and, and then <laughs> feeling miserably. Uh, I think his name is Sokoslov, was the technical chief of staff during this time. So Zhukov, wasn't in any way a powerful political actor. Rather, he was rehabilitated by the new leadership and he was given the position of deputy defense minister. And after the death of Stalin, after the purge of Beria, where he had proven himself so loyal to Khrushchev, and it's important to note that they were personal friends, and this does come across slightly in the film. They were together for years in Ukraine, uh, obviously Khrushchev as a political commissar, uh, Zhukov as a field commander. 
So when we talk about the relationship, it was incredibly strong. And by 1956, Zhukov can honestly, honestly be said, along with a yeah, figure like Mikhayan, to be the second most powerful man in the Soviet Union. So mm. powerful, in fact, that he actually began persuading Khrushchev that we go further with de-Stalinization. We begin a full rehabilitation of all of the figures in the army who were purged by Stalin during the Great Purge, such as Tukhachevsky. And again, Khrushchev being the savvy politician he does, he relies on Zhukov almost entirely to get rid of people like Malenkov, to get rid of people like Molotov and um, Kaganovich. And then when he's on holiday, he dismisses him and gets rid of him. <laughs> and so I much, believe that, so much for gratitude. Huh? Yes, and I believe there's a quote where Zhukov wonders, "Why do you do this to me?" Or you know, et, et, et to Khrushchev, or something like that. <laughs> uh, but you know, he's not been nothing but loyal and supportive of Khrushchev's uh, direction, and now he's got rid of him. And the question is, because Khrushchev, uh, Zhukov, I think it's fair to say, was inept when it came to politics. That had Zhukov been with. Uh, Khrushchev in 1964, Khrushchev could have possibly survived the purge by mm. Brezhnev and survived as political leader until his death. <laughs> the only sort of commiseration that Khrushchev got is that um, he wasn't killed and was able to live, or live on in sort of a uh, paltry retirement for the rest of his life. Well, I mean, wouldn't he have been... Um, I mean, I, 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 I would think that he would have been to some extent untouchable, what with the sort of the war prestige. But as you say, you know, if he was fallen from favor i mean people could be made to believe anything so i don't know i mean how how precarious was his position was he ever sort of genuinely in fear of his life or during stalin's reign of, um, um afterwards i mean you know well i think it's it's more a case of when stalin was alive was when a case where he, you know stalin would kill all of his generals <laughs> um <laughs> you know his generals were very much disposable to him i think the only general who could have survived Stalin because he was so politically loyal was Filoshilov, which is why, you know, I wonder why the film got rid of him because mm. he was incredibly incompetent during World War II and yet he survived simply due to being a loyal subordinate to Stalin in this very high ranking position in the Soviet army. Whereas Zhukov was only, again, he's, Zhukov is one of these figures which counteracts this idea that no one in the Soviet Union was indispensable. Stalin needed Zhukov desperately because Stalin could not fill that martial role he so desperately wanted to fulfill. And so there is this idea that Stalin was actually jealous of Zhukov. Mm. If anything, he wanted to incorporate Zhukov into himself to make some sort of mega Stalin, <laughs> as sort of ridiculous <laughs> as that position, uh, that, that notion sounds. Um, and as a result of that, I'm not sure whether Zhukov sort of understood the, the full reality of that, but Zhukov... Like I said, as long as Stalin was alive, Zhukov never made any overt political moves against Stalin. And he was always very sort of keen to observe the slightest elements of, you know, even the, the way that Stalin smoked his pipe. Little elements like that which would indicate Stalin's favor or displeasure. And I think that Zhukov survived for so long for being indispensable. And I believe that's the only reason he wasn't killed off after the Second World War was because of his military prestige and the idea of sowing such massive discontent in the Red Army, now the Soviet Army, after the war for killing off one of the principal heroes. So yeah. again, perhaps the better strategy is to leave you immensely decorated, but politically inept, politically inert, essentially. And that was his uh, strategy. Leave him as uh, a decoration. Well, yes, these men were certainly decorated. They look like Christmas trees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so does that answer your, your question about... Uh, I think so. I think so, yes. About Zhukov. So yes, and the, the funeral is where we get a lot of the plotting done. Um, which sort of forms the basis for the for the rest of the or the rest of the film. Really, the central argument revolves around Beria having stopped people from coming to Moscow to mourn Stalin. And again, this is a bone of contention for Zhukov. The thing that really pushes Zhukov, who is again wrongly portrayed as the head of the Red Army, against Beria is the idea that Beria is using the NKVD to fill functions that the army would normally fulfill. So it's this idea of stepping on toes and using the NKVD as a, you know a political base to almost eviscerate the army. Yeah. That, and again, this happens with Germany as well. And we talk about the relationship with the with the Wehrmacht and the SS. Mm. So these are these are these you know militant forces, essentially the militarized police of the Soviet Union versus the Soviet Army. It's an ongoing conflict which plays a key factor, I think in why the army was so willing to support the coup against Beria, 
why Beria was so hated. So that element of the film is completely true in terms of creating that sense of apprehension and division between other forces. Of course, it tones it down when it basically presents the NKVD had it existed as a monolith under Beria, where we mentioned how tenuous Beria's position was even within that superstrata of the Soviet security forces. So all of that has an element of truth, which I'm very happy with. What I'm not happy with is this being used as the pretext to get rid of Beria, which is the NKVD troops are in. Khrushchev makes a decision to allow the trains into Moscow, believing that the NKVD won't know what to do when they see these massive crowds. And so they fire into the crowds. Now, what this is, this is a combination of two events into one. Yeah. And the, when we talk about the, the segment I've just read, where he talks about, Khrushchev talks about Mary and Malenkov, um, talking about this idea of cancelling socialism or, you know, trying to remodify socialism in East Germany. This is absolutely essential, this idea of placing this conflict within the larger scheme. Because again, this film feels very claustrophobic. It almost feels that there isn't a world outside Moscow. The only sort of glimpses of a world outside Moscow is when you have the Chinese and North Korean officials attending the funeral, when in reality, of course, there would have been officials from not only all of the communist countries, but all of the heads of the communist parties and even non-communists throughout the entire world coming to the funeral to pay their respects. And uh, so I def therefore find that this element, this Moscow-centric nature of the film, where everything happens in Moscow, does, you can say, it damages the world building. A little bit but again this is the sort of thing i would expect from a play which is very much yeah, how this film yeah. is portrayed character-centered focus on these certain set pieces and allowing for this grand scale geopolitical struggle is almost not in the film's remit but what really does happen is Beria considers releasing the german democratic republic east germany which had been formed a few years prior when west germany was formed the idea was basically surrendering east germany to the west in terms of into return for massive aid, essentially. Mm. Um, Beria had a more ambitious aim, which is to revive Stalin's old plan of creating a neutral Germany, which would be a buffer between both states. But the chances of that actually happening were, I believe, virtually impossible. Otherwise, West Germany wouldn't have formed in the first place. So in reality, what Beria could only really ask for was returning the GDR to a united Germany in return for a massive payoff. And this horrified virtually everyone because it would have caused a major sort of retreat in the idea of the Soviet buffer regions. Um, and it also temporarily weakened the political structure in the German Democratic Republic. Mm. And so when I talk about these... Which was, which was precarious at the which best is, of Yes, time, you know, war conflict and the German Communist Party was only being held up essentially as a sort of an occupation force, which Beria was very keen of and keen about, and he kept making this reference over and over again to the fact that East Germany solely exists as a Russian, as an outpost of the Soviet army. And it's in this context that we see the rising of the 17th of June, which is a major mass rising of the population of East Germany against the communist government. And this fails. This is put down brutally by Walter Obricht and the local um, Soviet uh, commanders. But it is used as a pretext to say that Beria is intentionally destabilizing the integrity of the Soviet bloc for his own political agenda. In the film, we have other elements, such as him releasing prisoners, and that actually did happen. The, the doctor's plot was effectively canceled, put on hold. Uh, it was declared to be a fabrication, or again, virtually verbatim what we see in the film. There were other elements, like, you know, we'll let, we'll let a few low-level prisoners go. I think many as a million prisoners were let go in that first time. We mentioned particular figures, mm. such as Paulina being released, such as Alexei Kepler being released. But something which doesn't come across in the film, because this suffers as a result of the rather claustrophobic nature of the film, is that we don't talk about the autonomy of the various Soviet socialist republics. So another key issue was not just the fate of East Germany, it was also, also the idea of giving autonomy to regions which were incorporated after the Nazi Soviet pact. So we're talking about autonomy for the Baltic Republic, say for example, was another idea that Beria had floated. Um, all of this is omitted from the film and is this, which is the real basis for the party turning on um, barrier because you know Khrushchev would claim to be a reformer but he wasn't that much a reformer yeah. there were certain limits to how much power he was prepared to give away and of course all of these um, officials didn't believe that they were being sincere uh, I mean there's a wonderful phrase which I, I just mentioned what, what Khrushchev has to say about this 
I understood that this was just a subterfuge referring to Beria, the Asiatic way. By that term, we mean that a person is thinking one thing and saying another thing completely different. I understood that Beria was, was pursuing a two-faced policy, toying with me, trying to calm me down. But really, he was just waiting for the moment where he could deal with me, first of all, when the right time came. So I think that's very <laughs> much the impression. It's very much an impression of paranoia, that this man is trying to bring all the disaffected elements together and then he's going to give them all knives and send them out to stab all of the other opponents. Mm. Um, and of course, in the meantime, the effect of this policy is destabilizing the cohesion of the Soviet bloc. And it's the uprising and the crackdown in Germany in June of 1953, which is the real impetus to only 10 days later, get rid of him and officiate over that plot yeah. Which, again, the, the, there are certain elements with that where you have the scene, you have the meeting, and he's accused of treason. Pedantic elements, which is the fact that Khrushchev was the one chairing it, not Malenkov. But Malenkov, in that position, takes on a much more aggressive role. He's willing to actively support uh, Khrushchev in terms of his elimination of Beria. In the film, Malenkov is basically presented as being on site with, with uh, Beria all the way up until the end even almost being forced to yeah. uh, sign the official death warrant. And, you know, you have that moment where he mentions, you know, where his knife is uh, on his leg, but it's actually Malenkov who presses the button, which brings in the army. Which yeah, whereas Beria, Khrushchev has to it's, do it, yeah. It's not Khrushchev. So Malenkov I mean, it, is... It, it, it's also um, um, when you have the big scene, you know, where the soldiers shoot over their head and there's like a crush. This was also um, based on a real event that happened at the funeral, right? Where I think over a hundred people. Um, yes, this is suffocated. Th this is what I mean when they're, they're combining events. They're taking combining a these two, yeah, yeah. They're, they're taking a real world event, which is the suffocation of you know anything from a hundred to about a thousand people died yeah. because of the um, the massive crowds that were assembling outside the Kremlin to pay their respects to Stalin. Interestingly enough, this isn't the first time it's happened in Russian history. Virtually the same thing happened at Kadika Field after the coronation of Nicholas II. Well, it happens quite a lot. I mean, didn't something similar happen in Iran quite recently with um, Soleimani, didn't it? Yes, I think something yeah. before that happened in Bangladesh. But anyway, it's um, this is the impetus for all these deaths, these uh, pointless deaths that we see in the film. But what we see here is that there is a you can say a haphazard plot, which is the result of Khrushchev maneuvering potentially against Beria, which results in these, effectively these deaths are somewhat the responsibility of Khrushchev. But Khrushchev knows this and he's willing to let Beria take the blame, which leads to his downfall. Whereas in reality, we have the deaths at the funeral. That happens. It's not the result of the NKVD or what have you. And we have an actual uprising in Germany, which is put down, which is pinned indirectly on the policies of Beria. Mm. So as with all of these elements in the film, there are elements which are completely historically accurate. They're just fused together and recontextualized in order to take what is a much longer drawn out story and condensing it into a weak drama I mean, in one place. But, 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 but again, I mean, I mean, quite artfully done i mean if you had asked me to sort of you know um pick out these elements and mash them together in a way that you you know you preserve the the, the core again um i think it's a very difficult thing to do well um especially for such a short film i mean how long is this film it's like an hour and a half or something like that yes it's, it's a um, very short film and it gets all of these things i think across a real punch very well and effectively and the, the whole thing you need to know is Beria is eliminated as a result of his own party comrades turning on him and the army delivering the coup de grace. And that is effectively what happens historically. You're left without the bigger geopolitical picture. But again, one can wonder whether that was even possible to really contextualize and get across the audience in this film. Um, you know, possibly one could be more ambitious, possibly one cannot. But I think the film nevertheless is able to create a fiction which is grounded in some form of historical reality to deliver a similar result in the end. And of course, as with all these things in the film, all of this is sped up. In reality, Beria was put in prison and he stayed there for six months. And then there was a trial. It wasn't just Khrushchev um, relaying a bit of information. And, and again, it's more of an act of discovery. It's more that things about Beria are found out during this trial and they're relayed to him. And they mentioned the acts of, uh, this is another thing I need to mention because this is all true again. The, uh, the sexual uh, predatory nature 
Alberia. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's pronounced at the trial, but that's not how it happened. They didn't already know everything then. It was alluded to. It was an open secret in the Soviet um, the Soviet hierarchy. But all of this was came out and relayed in exquisite detail when it comes to the final trial in December of 1953, several months after the funeral. And little elements in the film, which are, again, just details of history, which is so easy to admit. When Beria picks the girl to summon her to rape her, he offers her flowers. And I read that Beria specifically utilized the effective use of flowers in order to differentiate between consent and non-consensual. So if a woman were to take the flowers, she would essentially be agreeing to engage in relations with him. If a woman refused to take the flowers, Beria would order them arrested. So it may sound disgusting, but little things like that, which are included in the film, mm. which again, so easy to overlook in terms of the, the scale of the, the horrific regime which Beria was announcing. Again, all the references he has to using you know, women for sexual favors to get their husbands out of a situation, murdering them anyway. The fact that he would personally get involved in these murders along with many other officials. All of this is true and all of this is relayed rather convincingly in the film, even down to the yeah. idea of what he indicated as consent and non-consensual. And the idea, again, that all of this was an open secret. For example, bringing this back to Svetlana and Beria, Stalin would not let Svetlana alone with Beria. Yeah. Because he yeah. knew what, what yeah. the behavior was and all the members of the Politburo would not let their children Elaine with Beria, because it was not only that Beria was a sexual predator, Beria was also a paedophile. But this was, again, this was, I hate to say it, this was ancillary information. This was just more darkness that came out during that trial. But it wasn't what got him shot. Um, what got him shot was the accusation of treason. Um, some elements were more outlandish. For example, there was a moment where it was possible the Soviet Union could have gone and had some form of peace with Nazi Germany, or at least there was an attempt to act through Bulgaria as a mediator. And Beria's role in that was open essentially for treason. But in the end, the general line was that Beria's policies were the result of him being a British agent meant to destabilize the Soviet Union. And mm. therefore, he was a <laughs> traitor against the Soviet Union. So again, that's more likely than most of fabrication. But there was generally a moment of relief from all of these officials on so many counts, like we see in the film, where Khrushchev is basically good riddance to bad rubbish at the end of the film, yeah. where they shoot him and again, cremate him and bury him in a forest in Moscow, which is all true to end such a grisly figure. Oh, he's such a horrific man. It's it upsets me. <laughs> it really does. It really does. And I'm Scottish, so I mean, you know. <laughs> yes, well, it's amazing that they took all of this material and were completely open with it and were able to make it into a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta give it to them, right? You gotta give it to them. I also I also do love the performance of um Veal as uh as Beria. Like in the in the end scene, you know, where he's just screaming at them all, um, you know, I, I've got stuff on all of you. I think he, I think he's fantastic. Oh, that really that moment good. in particular where Malenkov is going, no, all of you, all of you. And, I and was over here. Yeah. And they're quivering, they're quivering over the the exact gesticulation. <laughs> so funny, so good. Yeah. Oh, but it's some interesting how you can take a scene which is one, you know, uh, the NKVD chief trying to threaten to kill all of his. Uh, comrades and take that and make it a comedic sketch <laughs> again there is an element of genius in that which i do i think has to be appreciated even though we're not trying to uh, deconstruct the comedy because that's not really our arena <laughs> nevertheless no, you can't no. help but appreciate it if you have that I'm, dark comedic screen <laughs> i mean it's strain. more different it's more impressive than his other work because i mean you know the thick of it i mean british politics the comedy writes itself half the time doesn't it mm. but um yeah but again, the fact that this man was completely unrepentant, he didn't see his end coming. I mean, another thing Khrushchev notes is that Beria seemed surprised when you had the, the essentially the trap laid for him, where mm. he was denounced at that uh, plenary session, and that's he was again begging, very much, wasn't he? Yes, He's and that very much and that very much comes across 
in the film, but as with all of these elements of the film, uh, all of this is sped up. And it le le leaves the film with a, a bit of an epilogue where you have a performance again by Radio Moscow and you have a Brezhnev looking over him and alluding again to the idea that he was able to remove his rivals and he wasn't would in turn be removed by Brezhnev, which of course is all true. And we've alluded to that already, the idea that all of these officials, these doctrinaire um, Soviets would denounce the fact that Khrushchev in 1956 would come out with his secret speech against the legacy yeah, of Stalin yeah. and will begin the platform or earnest platform of reform of the Soviet Union away from the Stalinist model. And there was a huge pushback from within the Politburo of these figures correctly characterized in this film as doctrinaire Stalinists. And they would attempt a counter coup as was attempted with Gorbachev in the dying days of the Soviet Union. And the coup was unsuccessful. Zhukov was instrumental in ensuring the continuation of um, Khrushchev's regime. Um, what do you think about the betrayal, Jason Isaac's betrayal of Khrushchev? I mean, it's almost he's almost a meme in terms of how joking uh, it is. I mean, he's known for his frankness. Uh, he's known for his uh, I, I don't know his. Uh, well, I'm I'm curious. Um, um, because Jason Isaacs, he was um, I think his I think his dad was a jeweler or something, but he does have that sort of um, you know, working class, lower middle class background. And you know, I mean, what was what was Zhukov's um um actual background? Uh, I'll just look at it quickly. You know, I'd, I'd be curious. I'd be curious to see. Um... Uh, I mean, um, he's also. It should be important to know that Jason Isaacs also plays aristocratic characters quite a lot of the time. I mean, he plays a very similar role in, uh, you know, a, an aristocratic role in. Oh, Patriot. he was in the um, yeah, the Patriot. Yeah, he plays the um, yes, the, the uh, cavalry yes, commander, yes, the was yeah. a peasant family. So, and again, that's very similar to for all of these officials. I mean, sometimes you have these uh, cosmopolitan bourgeois figures like Lenin, and then you have all these uh, peasant iterations like Brezhnev and like Zhukov. So, um, yes, a Russian peasant. I mean, Ly Lysenko was a peasant as well, wasn't he? I mean, it became, I suppose it became more and more fashionable as time went on. Hmm. So there's one last thing which we really want to talk about, which is the reaction to the film from the Russian state authorities because it well yeah. a lot of things are brought up by this I mean again another element which is alluded to by Richard Overy is should we again is this an appropriate period to characterize let alone make a comedy I mean I'm rather libertarian when it comes to all of this thing and <laughs> I, I, I appreciate a good dark comedy I'm a fan of Iannucci so I say yes but again I do wonder why you know for example, you know, would it would it have worked? Say, for example, if a uh, downfall was an intentional comedy as opposed to an <laughs> unintentional comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You get um, oh, I don't know, Mike Mike Myers to play Hitler instead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but for people who don't know, um, Downfall is a German film about the. Oh, uh, everyone the final, knows the downfall memes. Surely, the final, you know? the final, They know the memes, not necessarily what film it comes from. Everyone knows about the Steiner meme. What, what's, it, what's it in German? It's like Der Untergang. Der Untertang, like yeah. 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 Um, and uh, it's a fantastic film, but it obviously deals with the subject matter very seriously. The I think the closest thing you can talk to in terms of like a caricature of this, but it's not really a comedy, it's probably Inglorious Bastards. There are yeah. comedic elements to that film, and Hitler is almost overly comedic in caricature. Yeah, there's that's no, like a big cape on as well. There, there's no there's no <laughs> nuance to that. I yeah. mean, in fairness, he's getting his portrait painted when that happens. Um, but, you know, there is no like nuance to that film. And I think the only thing that recently came out was, uh, I haven't seen it, but a film called Jojo Rabbit, uh, directed by Taika Waititi, the Marvel director, which is another reason why I didn't oh, necessarily want to grim. watch it. But um, he plays a characterized version of Hitler. And from what I know, the iteration of the performance of uh, Hitler in that film is a child's conception of Hitler, not a real Hitler. So when we look oh, at Inglourious... Wait, no, I remember seeing a... Tri yeah, it's like his sort of imaginary friend or something, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so it has to be several... like layers removed before you can make this an appropriate subject and i'm going to be very pretentious yeah, not that it's that difficult I'm no <laughs> <laughs> and say um if you're looking at this from a soviet soviet perspective then the death of stalin is a case of 
laissez majesty par excellence. It is mm. a insult against the very notion of the Soviet system and everything it stands for and the officials who made it up. Um, and again, it's in that sense, it is, you can say, the successor of testimony and that it is like an aspect of dissident literature, dissident drama against the Soviet Union. Mm. What makes this more interesting to me, though, is how it's actually been received in Russia post-Soviet Union. Understandably, to some extent, I wouldn't even say that understandably, the Communist Party, which is still the official opposition in the Russian Federation, didn't like the betrayal. Now, I find this odd because there is a lot of sort of Gorbachev-esque elements who vilify this period of history. Mm. And Khrushchev isn't necessarily betrayed that betrayed that badly in this film. I mean, Khrushchev is the closest thing you have to a protagonist. I mean, it was, yeah. of course, it's cynical. <laughs> uh, all of this is rather cynical. Uh, but I find I mean, it perhaps it, perhaps it's more if anyone's going to make these critiques, it should be us. You know, not yeah. a bunch of Yanks and Brits. Maybe, but to my mind, um, it's interesting that the Communist Party is prepared to defend this era, because even the Stalinist period is something that a lot of modern day communists, or, you know, Western communists, Eastern communists, more or less vilify for various different reasons, which don't want to get into. So that's interesting. But it's the fact that the Russian cultural ministry decided to ban this film, and even m members of the Zhukov estate came in to join in the uh, attempt to ban this film on the basis of inciting ethnic hatred, even because it was an Anglo-French production. The idea that the film was in some inciting way politically ethnic inciting ethnic hatred. And I wonder what possible justification can you argue for inciting ethnic hatred? I mean, none of <laughs> these characters... Against who? Ming or... <laughs> what? I mean, I mean, none of these characters are particularly russified. All the, the there are no sort of ethnic elements, of almost you know that caricature of them. I mean, what the, what is, what the film is doing rather well is almost taking characters like Stalin, in his you know rustic sort of um, peasant mentality, and trying to re trying to recontextualize recontextualize that as to how an English audience could conceive that, yeah. and the interpretation of that film is English Cockney. So I, I don't understand. It's not relying on stereotypes. I mean, even when you hear there's a quite a line in the film where. Um, Tambor as Malenkov says, you can kiss my Russian ass, saying in a very strong American accent. <laughs> there, there's a bit of, you know, an absurdity to all of this. I mean, you won't possibly get the impression in the film that these characters are all of different nationalities. How do you know that uh, uh, Simon Beale as Barrier is Georgian? And Stalin is Georgian. How do you know that Nikita is Nikita and Malakov are Russian? And how do you know that Kaganovich is Ukrainian? There's nothing in the film yeah. that can possibly get away from that. So I, I just again I wonder why the Russian state, not necessarily the Russian people, because this film, from what I gather, has actually been quite well received from those who have seen it. I wonder I mean, why. Some, some, sometimes with with these sorts of things, it can be to do with you know the way the film's been promoted, you know the way the film is talked about, and and, and I'm, I'm kind of curious because it wasn't really. I mean, I, I heard about it, but it wasn't really on my radar in a big way in 2017, and so I didn't really follow the the hype and the reviews, and so I wonder if a lot of that, the you know the bump surrounding the film, perhaps contributed to this. Um, very strong response from the Russians, but I really again, don't know. It's, really again, don't know. It's, it's not the Russians; it's the Russian cultural ministry. Well, like I yes, said, it's, it's it's relegated, and I and I wonder because it brings up many questions of how the modern political system in Russia has to contextualize Stalin. And I think it's fair to say that Putin tries to contextualize Putin uh, tries to contextualize Stalin in the fact that he was a Russian patriot. And, yeah, but he was he was a war hero. He was the one yeah, so, war, right? That's I mean, when thing. when you look at the Great Patriotic War, which, if anything, from a communist perspective, is a misnomer. Um, many Russians are still incredibly proud of that, probably more so than anything in the West. Yeah. And I mean, I, mean I, I would say, uh, and you know, I, I have a couple of Russian friends, and, and I've had people tell me that essentially, you know, a lot of Russians look on Stalin like we look on Churchill, you know, I mean, because, you know, it's well known that Churchill did a lot of terrible things as well. Um, um, and he wasn't a very pleasant man, but he won the war, and that counts for everything, right? Um, yes, and so I do, uh, I do think they're sort of comparable in that. In fairness, in fairness to Churchill, though, um, he didn't kill twenty million of his own people. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't that bad. Wasn't unless that you're bad. unless you're going to be an Indian nationalist and claim he was responsible for the Bengal famine. Which I, is... <laughs> I I am half 
Bengali, so um, yeah. Oh yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Reveal. I'm, I'm sorry I offended you, Columba. But <laughs> um, no, there, there are lots of interesting questions about how one contextualizes the Stalinist period within the modern conception of Russian history, and definitely a nationalist, anti-Western conception of Russian history. Very much Stalin fits into that mold. Yet, of course, he was also a monster by any definition i mean we're talking about him in terms of appreciating his intelligence i mean it's one of my many sins that i tend to i'm drawn and attracted to figures who display incredible amounts of intelligence yet also i'm explaining how morally repugnant all of this is yeah. if anything i mean the an issue of being a historian is that it kind of it kind of desensitizes you to all of this stuff and you yeah. just become to the focused. point where you're you, you know you're you're seeing how he someone got someone killed or whatever and you're like wow you, you gotta give it to them on this one <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. i know i know the feeling i know the feeling but that again is when, when you're exposed to so much history unless you're sort of politically invested in it or morally invested in certain people you have to sort of approach it in almost in an inhuman way with a certain state of dispassionate a dispassionate approach but again i, I find it interesting how one can take elements of stalin which are acceptable such as you mentioned, the the Russian devotion to the great the great patriotic war narrative, and this idea of uh, Stalin as the, again the savior of the Russian people, less so the Soviet people. Even things like taking the Stalin commissioned um, Soviet anthem and repurposing it to be good, the Russian national anthem. Um, again, it's all of these little elements of history that don't exactly sit very well together. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to, again, focus on certain aspects while leaving a very blind sort of spot on others. It's, it's interesting to me, but I do find that the the Russian reaction to this film was ridiculous. I can't help but, you know, but, but say I'd like that. To I'd like to read like some, because the ministry must have put out some statements, right? You know. Well, yes. Yeah, so the focus in responding to a lot of the pushback from the film was mainly based around the portrayal of war heroes and that's why Zhukov was one of the figures and the fact that again he's presented as a caricature whereas even yeah, yeah he's sort of running through the palace with a machine gun like blasting people <laughs> yes and I, I don't know again maybe it's because I'm I'm not Russian and I'm I'm English and I'm, I'm used to being self-deprecating and I'm mm. used to not really taking anything very seriously and you know I'm, I would be very happy to see you know a an even more buffoonish betrayal of Churchill, perhaps in a comedy mm. with Montgomery as a sidekick and see how well it works. <laughs> and I wouldn't bat an eye. So the many interesting questions one can draw as to how this pertains to the oh. modern situation. But again, I think that's where I'm going to leave this conversation, I think, on this wonderful film for this evening, unless you want to bring anything up. No, no, no. I've been, um, I, I can only apologize. I've been content to sit at the feet of the master on this one. But uh, <laughs> no, I have. I have. You know, I mean, if you don't have anything to say, sit and listen. And I've learned a lot. Right. Well, I'll, I'll go to the super chats then. So, well, thank you very much, Columba. I mean, I, I wish I had something more to say. I just, um, more focusing again on the, uh, the possibility of who would have been uh, Stalin's heir. I mean, Suslov is another possible contender. He, after Khrushchev was dismissed, would become one of the great sort of ideologues behind Brezhnev and uh, a key supporter of Andropov. But um, what was that? Very... Um, what was that book that you mentioned by Overy Dictators? Yeah. We, would you rec would you recommend reading that? You know, if I wanted to read about the you know the history of this period and the politics, is there anything you would recommend for people? Yes, can I be completely honest? I haven't read it in about 10 years, probably longer. So I honestly can't remember most of it. As the case with so many books, I'm very sorry. For some reason, it sort of um, crosses my mind. I mean, there are a lot of books which have recently been published about this. Um, Roy Medvedev has published a book called The Unknown Stalin. Um, mm -hmm. Simon Seabag Montefiore published a book and I don't particularly like any of these books really I mean I actually found it rather refreshing just going to the ostensibly primary sources for this stream rather yeah. than relying on secondary material um because I don't know I, I find it more interesting to digest really yeah. and uh, I've been I mean, trying Monteviore, he was the one who dug up some of the stuff on the the sort of doctor's plot yes and yeah. uh, he's he's more in the camp of uh foul play mm. um so it's interesting but no I'm I, I'm maybe i'll write my own book about this one day maybe maybe <laughs> if i can learn russian and i can have access to the archives uh, given the current situation it might be quite difficult to go to russia anyway <laughs> pelinol white strake for four pounds and 49 pence great film love the actor who was stalin though the role was brief 
characterized like a London gangster. Very apt. And yes, I, I loved Adrian McLaughlin's very brief appearance. I, I kind of wonder whether it would be more interesting if we saw more flashbacks to the character later on. We have mm. the moment of his death because, again, that, that seems to be the way that the graphic novel was really portrayed. I mean, it is a film about the death of Stalin, but really you can say it's more of a film about the fall of Beria than it is a film about the death of Stalin. Yeah, you can almost yeah. say the death of Stalin is incidental. Um, so maybe that's an interesting way you could have taken it. Um, and also a retrospective on Stalin himself, because in the memoirs, Khrushchev does reflect a lot on the legacy of Stalin. Interestingly enough, just bringing up the other sources for today, so does Shostakovich. And I think it's something the film really doesn't do that well. Um, it brings up certain elements such as wanting to not go around aimlessly massacring people, <laughs> um, which was a testament to Stalin's uh, enduring style of governorship that never really changed since he came to power. Enduring style. <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of it reminds me of your like the favorite comment um, that you ever made was um the, the summit of Catholic polemicism. Uh, yes, it still, it still makes me laugh. Yes, yes, I I, I can come out with these wonderful turns of phrase even occasionally, if they are yeah. inappropriate. Anyway, <clears throat> don't conflate the Anglosphere with American internet culture, do we? No. I don't think we do. Um, and Dee's, who? Who's this from? Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, just a comment that came in. Um, Dee's Bit of Rough for pound and 79 p Thank you very much, Dee's Bit of Rough. Don't Can say you it again. <laughs> Dee's Bit of Rough. <laughs> oh, you're a sick man. I am. I am. I'm very dark. Screwed up. <sighs> Can you both snap me like a Kit Kat? Ooh, woo. Well, <laughs> you're, you're, I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you're very happy that I've, that I've been paid to say that these bit of rough. So thank you for making me say that. I look how you've lowered yourself for, for, for what was it? One pound. <laughs> I know. I know. Another, another dollar in your G string. Um... Negro Nazi. <laughs> it's not getting better it's not getting better for two euros the stream is definitely demonetized it'll be a miracle if it's monetized well with names like these <laughs> you're not helping I don't know maybe we should have spent the entire stream talking in euphemisms rather than saying names <laughs> as well yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you well thank you I'm not going to say your name again if that's alright so thank you again Valero, 393 for $5, which Jason Isaac's role strayed more from history, Zhukov in Death of Stalin or Tavington in The Patriot. Well, I mean, I'd, Tavington's a fictional character, so... I'm not going to mention The Patriot. You're not going <laughs> yes, to make yes. me do The Patriot. <laughs> I've already done one uh, xenophobic Mel Gibson film directed at the English. I'm not going to do another one. It seems a bit redundant. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, the one... he will imitate the death of Stalin and have a cerebral hemorrhage right yes. here, right now. But I feel like I'm having that right here, right now. Um, but no, I, one of the things I enjoyed about reviewing this film in particular is that I liked it. <laughs> it's a historical <laughs> film that I actually <laughs> makes enjoy. Change, yeah. It makes, makes a change because usually it... Uh, they destroy me. They make me die a little bit inside. Um, it, it's uh, interesting enough. I was listening to a uh, review of this. And they were wondering how the film would have gone across had all the characters tried on Russian accents. And I'm so glad they didn't. Have you yeah. ever seen the film Child 44? I haven't. No, I, I know of it, but I haven't seen it. Well, for some reason, they took a real case about a Russian mass murderer in the 90s, and they wanted to place it in the Soviet period um, for some reason. And all this I can remember about this film is that you had all of these ensemble cast. In, in particular, it was, a, um, oh my goodness, how have I forgotten his name? I'm really sorry. Um, Gary Oldman mm. and Charles Dance all just coming on. It really seemed the only reason they all agreed to this film was that they could try their Russian accents. <laughs> That's the only <laughs> reason the film exists. And it's so jarring 
because they're all trying Russian accents. And um, it's the same with um, uh, Daniel Craig, who is the protagonist. Oh, so, that'd be rough. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very glad that they didn't do this with this film. And again, it uh, would ostensibly moderate the idea that you're trying to mock or caricature the Russians, but clearly that didn't uh, work as a strategy. Um, Mombasa Timmy for one New Zealand dollar and no message. Well, thank you very much, regardless for your super chat. Now that is it in terms of super chats. So does anyone have anything, Columba, that you would like to say before we go? Um, anything that I would like to say? Um, not really. Um, I got in touch with the guys at the Mallard. Um, if anyone knows that sort of magazine, the online magazine, and apparently they're going to start running a poetry section as well. So another place to infect with my um, my dog role. So keep an eye out. <laughs> yes, do check on that. And remember to follow Columba on Twitter if you want. My tendrils. Up, my tendrils. updates on your, um, your poetry. You've also been... Um, uh, putting out a lot of tweets on Chinese painting recently, a lot of Song Dynasty stuff. Yes, are... I it's because I'm occasionally when I'm when I'm when I'm bored or or whatever, I go on the um you know the Metropolitan Museum of Art because they love really high quality images. And I was just going through um they have this sort of um Chinese collection and there was just a bunch of very beautiful pieces. I mean there was even one painting that was actually the work of one of the um the Song Dynasty emperors who was quite a quite a talented artist so um yeah if you like if you like art posting by all means follow follow my twitter i, I post some art um no, nothing compared to master d though i mean i know it's cliche but just because modern leaders have no conception of art doesn't mean that historical leaders it wasn't actually quite common no. um especially chinese emperors and of course ottoman sultans renowned for their exquisite calligraphy yeah. all of this gone I'm very sad. Interesting. I didn't get any any super chats questioning my um my interpretation of 1941 regarding the the beginning of the war. So uh, I'll take that as everyone agreeing with me on that front, <laughs> even though I thought I was being rather controversial. Anyway, so, um, um, are, are you are you going to be um celebrating the jubilee? Are you going to be out in the street? Have you got your bunting set up? Yes. Well, un unfortunately, if people want my if people want to anticipate my thoughts on jubilee week i do have a stream called the queen <laughs> of the ashes <laughs> yeah, regarding do. our current monarch if you want to go and check that out otherwise on saturday next week i will be having otto poll around to continue in this vein this topic by talking about what happened to the germans in the east in particular yeah. what happened to the russian germans and his book which has just come out so and thank this you is his um this is his wheelhouse so it should be good oh yes so thank you everyone for listening thank you columba for coming on for being such a stellar guest and good night